Hey, everybody, welcome to the Gym Masters Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Talk Show Series. How are you guys doing? It's so nice to see all your smiley faces, as we always say. Busy day around here. I had four radio shows to host, then a TV shoot, then I had to write scripts for a TV news segment that's happening tomorrow, and then another shoot Friday, another one Saturday. It's that kind of crazy busy around here. But it's so nice to see all of you. And if your life is busy, crazy, if uh, you didn't have a good day today, stick with us. We've got an amazing show and an amazing guest. We have Grammy-winning drummer, producer, songwriter extraordinaire. Tony Brunigal is here live and direct from Studio City, California. He's also going to take us on a little mini tour of his uh, home and studio and take us right to his drums. He's going to play live exclusively for us. Yeah, that's what you get here on our show, entertainment, as well as our poignant conversations. We've done almost 650 shows, and we're bringing back that lost art of conversation. Last night, we had the amazing Kreskin on. Yes, mentalist Kreskin was here. If you missed that episode, check it out. It's available for viewing in uh, the binge section, which is the entire section of our YouTube channel. Matter of fact, for those of you who are watching live right now, we welcome every single one of you. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for all the support, the love. We've been doing this show since April of 2020. We've done hundreds of episodes. We've had hundreds of guests. We have thousands of viewers, and we love you all. Matter of fact, you guys are called the JMS Lovety Squad, and we welcome the JMS Lovety Squad. They are the real faithful, diehard fans who are here through thick and thin, through heck or high water. <laughs> Whatever happens, they're here. I mean, we've had some of our viewers have, you know, uh, micro bursts and tornadoes and blizzards, and they still never miss. Well, somebody went out in their car because they lost Wi Fi. I, I forgot which viewer that was. They lost Wi Fi in their house, and they love the show so much. They went out in their car and they used their cell phone signal or something because they didn't want to miss an episode of the Gym Master Show Live. That is what you call true lovity. We love all of you and uh, we appreciate you guys being here. If you'd like to comment live while the show is live, there's two ways you can comment. You can comment live while the show is on in chat. That's exclusively for subscribers of our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. So make sure you do hit that red button you see right there on our YouTube channel, subscribe. There's no cost for that at all. And click the notification bell so you never miss any of our episodes. They are incredible. They are really unique, what we're doing here. Our community of Lovity and all the fantastic guests and conversations and surprises and so much more. So if you'd like to comment live while the show is on and be a part of our exclusive JMS chat room, you can do that when the show is live. We encourage you to do that. We usually take a look at some of the comments as well. You can also do super stickers, super chat, super emojis that help support our show big time. We put that right back into the production costs and everything that we do. Um, you can also comment on the YouTube channel which we hope you will do uh, right underneath this episode and all the episodes you guys enjoy and give it a hearty thumbs up like. Yes, give it a hearty thumbs up like. That helps us. When you click like and when you leave a comment on the YouTube channel, YouTube sees that, they blast the episode. They take this episode and all of them, blast them out even further. We have a global audience, but they take that and they blast it out even further which is really awesome. Hope everybody's doing well. If this is your first time here joining us, we welcome you. And we invite you to binge watch over 600 plus episodes we've done already with incredible guests from celebrity friends to all kinds of different guests from around the world. Really cool stuff. Coming up right now, he was getting his um, drums and the audio and everything all set and ready. He wanted to make sure that everything sounded and looked perfect because he's a pro. So we are so excited to have him here. He's a legend in the industry, uh, Grammy-winning drummer, producer, songwriter. Tony Bronicle is here, and he has worked with some of the greats. He is one of the greats as well. Uh, he's worked with Bette Midler, Bonnie Raitt, works with Taj Mahal, of course, as well, the Phantom Blues Band, and so many incredible people. That's just a few. That just is a few. He's originally from Houston, yes, down south in Houston, Texas. He makes his home in uh, Studio City, California, 
And he is a prolific musician and music aficionado, lover. He's all about it. Also a session musician as well. So he's played, you know, backing for a lot of great artists and a, a lot of other material as well, I'm sure, in television and film and other areas. I'm going to talk about all of that as we welcome him live from Studio City, California, here on the show. We're going to check some of your comments that are piling up as well. Thanks, gang, for all those great comments. We see them there. So keep them coming in chat. We love you all for doing that. And uh, let's welcome our buddy, Tony, joining us live from Studio City, California. Tony, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live. It's good to have you with us. Thank you, Jim. It's great to be here. And hello to all of the Jameis Le Levities, as you all are out there. Yes, you got it. You got that memo, the, the Levity Squad. And that yeah. just happened when I you know, said light love levity too fast. And that's kind of cool to have that, especially during a pandemic, wouldn't you say? Well, there's, you know, happy accidents are just always welcome in my house. You know what I mean? In my yeah. world. So, I mean, whenever you, you, you mispronounce something as you did, it turned into something as nice as a, a wonderful crew of people that uh, you can give a great name to now. So. Absolutely. So you're there in Studio City, but your roots are in Houston. I was on a TV shoot, a couple of TV shoots in Houston. Houston's a great city and it's amazing. I couldn't believe we were in Houston. We were in the Woodlands. We were in Conroe, that yep. whole area. And then we were over in Austin and Dallas. But uh, the flavor of Houston is really cool. There's a lot of music, a lot of great restaurants and the place is growing by leaps and bounds. I couldn't believe how uh, big Houston has gotten in recent years. Tell us about growing up in Houston and some of those influences and inspirations in your life that put you on this trajectory to get into music, Tony. Interesting question. <laughs> uh, you got an hour and a half. Uh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, we we actually do. <laughs> the lovelies know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I'll it a little bit. Um, yeah, as a kid growing up there, I I was. Um, uh, uh, my parents were into music. My father played music and, and the music that was pretty much indigenous to what was going on around there at the time was mostly country music. And my father was a country music musician, but he didn't really play professional professional. He was a weekend warrior, as we call it in the business. Yeah. And, and I, so I was always around it and I, and I could tell, and they could tell as well early on that I responded to music as a kid, I would dance and, you know, yeah. And, uh, and whatnot. As you know, when little babies dance, I guess I was one of those. <laughs> Did you play uh, with the pots and pans for drums they, too? They didn't have YouTube back then, so they didn't throw me on it. You know? <laughs> Did you take the wooden spoons and hit your mother's pots and pans too? And that's how I started out playing drums in the backyard was boxes and pots and pans. You know, boom, that box sounded like that. And those pans made a nice ringing noise. And, and I'm back there sitting on a little bitty stool about yay high because I was only about yay high. And and I'm beating on them and whatnot. And so they're going, oh, it's nothing. He just likes to make noise, you know. <laughs> and then I was turned on to seeing people play live. My cousin had a drum kit. And, I, and I'm and i like, my eyes are like so big when I'm watching him play. And I couldn't wait for him to move away from it so I could sit on it. And then he'd have to shove me out of the way and go, go yeah. on, get out of here. Yeah. And um, so I, it stayed after it. And I was turned on to, I was turned on to uh, from the country thing. I was turned on to the basic rhythm and blues of the area yeah. from the two uh, African-American stations down there uh, yeah. by my cousin. And um, so I, it was really, really, I, I just, I got, I got mind sick, heart sick with this music and it just took me over. And I started listening to that a bunch and I started playing music and I started tapping around a real drum kit that I didn't own yet around the age of 13 or something like that. And then I bought my first drum kit when I was 15. And I started playing that very night because I'd already been studying the music. And um, that launched me into, you know, being doubted by everybody in the family, like as to what I was going to do for my future. You know, <clears throat> you need to be a doctor or a lawyer because you're a straight A student. And I was, uh, well, I don't know. I'm going to do what I feel like doing, basically, mm -hmm. you know. Right. So, and I did, and I saw that through and followed my dream for all of those years. And um, I, growing up in Houston, there was a, I, I think there's a fertile music scene. That's what I call it. I don't think that Houston promotes its own talent as well as other cities do, but uh, it, if that's a fault, but they do, but they do have tons of talent there. And there always was, and I, I was, I was exposed to some things that 
are in history books, you know, mm-hmm. like certain artists back in those days. Yeah. In the third war and the fifth war and, and um, Duke and Peacock records era and stuff like that. Pretty historic, really musically, if you're looking at blues and jazz. Oh, yeah. So um, then I started playing in nightclubs, which is what you do and what you did back then. And, and that wasn't really welcomed by my parents. But but I, you know, I kept it together. Then I stopped doing that and I went into the try to get into a band writing songs, you know, yeah. about around the age of 20 and 21 and getting excited about <clears throat> really getting out into the world and not just being some local guy working in a bar, you know, and, uh, and it worked. We got a record deal and uh, a band called Buttermilk Bottom and we, we were signed to Polydor Records and um, it, it, the, the record was on the radio, but we didn't, it wasn't a big hit. And then um, I joined another local band and I was already packing my bags about the time I joined this other band, because I said, I'm going where the big boys are. I'm, I'm moving to California or New York. And uh, and I had literally had my car like two weeks from being my Volkswagen from being packed with a drum kit and one suitcase. That was all I was taking. Was that a Beetle or a Bug? It was a Beetle. It was, it was a 1967 <laughs> Beetle. Bug. I was driving to California. That's the way I was going to go. And um, uh, I got another offer from another band that I'd always been interested in, and I stuck around with them. And I said, "Okay, guys, I, I, I'll stick around for a while, but we got to be out of this town in a, in, a, in a year, you know." And uh, only because there was no way to promote yourself in, into the business and in the big part of the business right. in, in that scene that we were living in. And uh, as much as we tried with the local situation, nah, nothing happened. Yeah. So we ended up uh, putting ourselves out there in our demos and got a deal, a record deal in New York City. And um, we moved, we all drove up there, a bunch of hippies driving up to, you know, and got us a house upstate New York and went in and out of the city and worked at, uh, at, uh, at Electric Lady. And, uh, and I got to really check, I got to live New York style yeah. on the streets as a poor musician. And it was a lot of fun. I won't yeah. trade it for anything. I won't trade the, the near starvation several times and the experiences that, you know, when you're in that situation, you're going to create something really good. Like you're going to find a way to, you know, find the good in it. So yes. It was a it was a good learning experience for me. What so. were some of the experiences that you came out of New York with? Were there some connections? Were there some specific projects that you worked on that really were fantastic that you remember? Well, you just always get to meet people. Like you know, the we the studio we were working in and the producer we were working in, uh, the guy's name was Ron Johnson, and he was the producer that worked with us and worked with another band called Wicked Lester. Wicked Lester was the predecessor to K-I-S-S. Mm, yeah. Kiss. yeah. So those guys were coming around and we we're all kind of hanging out. And I, I, I never, I didn't really carry on great relationships ever since then. But if I ran into Paul Stanley, he'd say, Hey man, are you doing, you know, it's that kind of thing. I don't know that I got, Oh, I, well, yeah, there was an incredible opportunity while we were there. Johnny Nash, who had had a, a great big hit with, uh, I could see clearly now and some of the other reggae songs that he had, um, needed a band. And, mm-hmm. um, so we were approached to see if we wanted to be his band. And um, we said yes. And um, we went on the road with Johnny. And then we did some recording with Johnny. And he recorded one of my songs that I wrote uh, on the record that we did. And that was a really excellent experience because there were four people from Texas in the band, in the rhythm section. And then there were four Ghanaians in the band as well. And the three of them were horn players. And one, one was a percussionist. So when you fuse... Those two cultures together musically, you come up with something very interesting. Yeah. And we call ourselves the Sons of the Jungle. And we did some recording on our own, but we never really got a chance to go out and do what we wanted to do. But I would say that is probably one of my favorite musical things that was that happened during that whole period. Because for me to be working with that those guys from that culture of Western Africa was a game changer. Yeah. Right, and right. They taught me things that today I still use. Like what? What would be a few things that you absorb that you apply now as a result of all of that? How a rhythm works when it's played a certain way that it's not necessarily up and down as it's written on the paper. How to make things swing, how to put things into a, a different type of a pulse, you know, uh, teaching you how they use it by dancing when you play something. You know, right. they go watch me i play the cowbell and i dance and they do this thing and 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 you go 
you go, I'm supposed to learn how to play by watching you dance. It takes a minute. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But then you go, okay, I'm playing to that. And it really is, it is almost tactile like that, you know? Yes, with, right. With that music. And you know, if you saw uh, an, an, an incredible sort of uh, uh, African band right now playing and just lit up, you, you wouldn't be able to stand still. You know? No, not at all. No, absolutely. That was a great period. I, I really enjoyed working with all those people. And, and then we, uh, after getting out of there, we kind of, went back to Texas for a minute and, and worked around in the, the, the bars and, and whatnot, uh, waiting to see what was going to happen next. And I had three choices, San Francisco uh, with a girlfriend that I'd met from there, uh, or Los Angeles, where my best friend that I grew up with, uh, uh, Willie Arnellis, who sold me my very first drum kit, which is a really wonderful, funny, long story, but I could, you know, maybe another show. Um, is there a condensed version or? <laughs> all, right. Okay. all right, all right, all right. So I, Willie was my neighbor and I was, I would play his drum kit and he would help me and he would teach me and we would listen to all this incredible music all day long that we, that with it, that is this the foundation of, of how I play and who I am. And um, one day we're sitting there at the, at the table in the, in the, in the, in the kitchen and his phone rings and, and he's already asked me, he says, you wanted to buy that drum kit there? And I go, wow. Uh, that means I got to get money. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm only 15, uh, but I, yeah, I'd love to have a drug kit. Uh, but, uh, well, let me think about this. And uh, well, maybe I'll go sell my motor scooter and, you know, and that'll be some money. And um, uh, the phone rings, he picks up the phone and uh, is a friend of his. And he says, uh, hi, Charlie. Yeah. Um, uh, no, I'm working tonight. I can't, I can't do uh, the, the, no, I can't do do I know somebody else? Um, uh, yeah, I, yeah, I know somebody else. And he looks across the table at me. I'm 15. I've never played in a nightclub before. He looks across the table at me and he goes, you want to do the gig? And I said, I, I said, that's wow. Call, that's him calling now because He's since you were 15, you hadn't answered that question. Right. He, <laughs> he, he said, don't tell the story. No. Um, he said, <laughs> You want to do the do the gig and and my fifteen year old voice. I said, well, I don't know. I got to ask my mom and dad. You know, so <laughs> still going through puberty. I, yeah, <laughs> you know, kind of at the tail end of it. So I I I drove my motor scooter over. I sold it. I came back with the money. It was a barely half of the drum kit. And and um and then I um I um um went back to Willie's. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. I had asked my mom and dad if I could work that night in a nightclub. And so yeah. um, I did. And um, it was quite an experience of uh, quite a few no's and no's and no, you're no, absolutely not no's. And, and finally I, I shoved it until they said, uh, well, all right, but just, just, you know, don't do anything silly. And I said, like what? And they said, don't take any funny cigarettes from anybody right. <laughs> and don't talk to the women. And my cry was like, hey, I'm only 15 years old. What do I, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> So I went back down to Willie's and I got, uh, I gave him the money and I told him, said, I can do it. So he calls the guy, Charlie back and he's Charlie, I got you a drummer. He said, but he doesn't have a car. You got to pick him up. Can you come to my house and pick him up? And they, so Charlie pulls up in the driveway the, the, the allotted time and he looks and he goes, uh, I'm looking for a guy named Tony. Is Willie here? That's my Texas accent. He says, I'm looking for Tony, a, a friend of Willie's. Is he here? And I'm standing there and go, hi, I'm Tony. You know? <laughs> and I wasn't very tall. I was, you know, five foot two at the time or five foot three. And I'm five eight now, so I'm still not real tall. And um, so he, 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 he looked at me like aghast, like, oh, my God, what has Willie done? So yeah. we put the drums in a car and, and we drive down the road and he starts asking me questions about where I played and everything. And so I. I hope this is condensed enough for you. That's no, yeah. great. Yeah, it's yeah great. Uh, I drive down the road and he's asking me about where have I played. And I said, well, I played in a, my friend's, my cousin's garage. And I played at a couple of sock hops at high school. And, uh, you know, and he's got, he's like going, wow, they can't believe this. And here's the funny part. So he starts laughing and he says, that darn Willie, he's done it to us, hasn't he? You know, oh, boy, you know, and then, of course he had a few other vectives to add to it. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> And I didn't see the, I mean, I, I, the bass player was in the front seat with his back to me. And, and he, and he said, this is so-and-so the bass player. And, and I didn't see his face yet. And, and so I just fessed up. And I said, at that moment, I said, Charlie goes, so is this your first gig? And I said, 
yeah, this is my first gig. And, you know, I'm believe, you know, being honest. And, he, and uh, the bass player turns around from the front seat with a glass eye and goes, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can say that. <laughs> really scary look. And at 15, I was scared. I'm in the back seat with two strangers and I'm going to a nightclub. It's my first gig. And we get there and we go and I set up and I'm, I don't know what to do. I just set up on the stage and I st sit there in the corner waiting yeah. till it's time to play. And uh, these guys are walking around and drinking beer and smoking cigarettes and doing like what you did, at, you know, in those days. And, uh, and I'm waiting. And then the, the saxophone player shows up at the last minute and his name was Armando something. And, and he takes a sax out of his last minute, takes a sax out of the case. And Charlie says, Armando, this here is Tony, our drummer for the night. And Armando said, hey, man, nice to meet you. Never thought, didn't have any preconceived thoughts about my age or, or how I looked or whatever. He just says, and he counted off the song like that fast, ready to go. And I just started playing. I knew the song. I was lucky. I knew the song. Mm -hmm. I started playing, and I never looked back. And that was like I was launched that day off into the world of being a drummer. And I, I didn't know where it was going to lead me. But that was the story of the day I bought my drum kit, and um, I That's made enough incredible. money. And I made it's so funny because at the end of the night they drove me home and they said, yeah. "What are you doing next weekend?" <laughs> wow! So I heard back immediately, so I went. Yeah. I said, that's that's yeah. a sign, you know. That's that's incredible. So, yeah. you know, around that age, what was the music you were listening to, and who were the people that you were inspired by, Tony? Um, Bobby Bland, Ray Charles. Uh, uh, all of the rhythm of blues that came out of gospel at that period in the sixties, uh, especially, uh, stacks, you know, uh, uh, some chess record stuff. Okay. Labels specialty, uh, all of the blues and jazz labels, uh, chess records, uh, had the earlier more rootsier blues, you know, and, um, uh, and then, um, you know, and then rock and roll kind of crept in a little bit there. I, I liked the Beatles, but I, I didn't really like white pop rock rock and roll on the radio that much. You know, I, I, you know, it, it maybe when I was ten or eleven. You know, yeah, yeah. But I got over it once I got in, in, inducted into this other culture of music. You know, yeah. And, and and I really wanted to hear that all the time, and I wanted to play that all the time, and I did. Yeah, that's so, really really cool. Now, when you decided, okay, time to move on from the Big Apple and start to head west. What was that decision like? And was there something larger? Did you just want to go west to test things out? Or were there were there specific gigs and projects that were waiting for you? Well, the next opportunity to go west, which was after I moved back to Texas, and, and I proclaimed again that I'm going to go, and I thought I was setting it up. I got a phone call, and I had a friend from my hometown, Houston, Texas, by the name of John Rabbit Bundrick, who spent about, I don't know, 12 or 15 years in The Who, much later in his life. but we grew, kind of grew up in the same area in Houston and he was living in London and he had a record deal with Island Records. And he said, um, I spoke to the record label and I explained who you and the bass player Terry Wilson are and what you mean to me in my life as musicians. And so um, if you can get a way over here, we can give you a job with a stipend and uh, a place to live. And so I went, wow, London, England. Um, a long ways i can't mm, can't drive there uh <laughs> it's a long swim <laughs> nagled away out of the management for johnny nash who's also our publisher at the time and we said hey dan danny help us go over there well he knew chris blackwell very well at island because he had already discovered bob marley and and bob marley and johnny nash had been writing together in the basement of uh, a huge apartment in, in Stockholm, Sweden for years where all those early hits were written that Johnny Nash had that he wrote yeah. with right. Bob Marley. So I'm weaving. And so Danny said, sure, Tiger, come on up to New York. And he flew us up to New York and we had a meeting. And in the meeting, we decided that we would also continue writing for him and that it would help us to live because he would advance us, uh, you know, royalties a little bit at a time if we would continue to writing songs and, and putting them into his publishing company. And so we, next thing you know, I'm landed in London, England, and I'm not met by anyone, but I'm given an, uh, you know, a, an address and a key and, and someone met us and gave us a key to an apartment. 
I'm living on King's Road in Chelsea, you know, and it's a funky old uh, one, two, three and a half story apartment right now, which is worth about ten million dollars, you know, dress. But we lived there and we got a stipend to pay our bills with and to eat on. And then we were allowed to do anything else that we were offered to do. So we were recording sessions at, at Island all the time and uh, with a lot of different artists that, that were up and coming in their their roster. And um, I worked with Jim Capaldi from Traffic. I worked with uh, blah, 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 uh, Speedy Keen um, from uh, Something's Happening Here. What was that band? Uh, uh, yeah. And I played on some um, Thunderclap Newman. Oh, and yeah. I played on some reggae stuff, and I played on some uh, rootsy African stuff, and I continued to write songs. And I uh, played on artists that weren't really well known yet. But what happened was our reputation had spread around town that this rhythm section bass player drummer from Texas were in town and it sounded novel to a lot of people and they wanted to hire us and we would go out and, and work in recording sessions and I would be in at Olympic studios, which is, you know, amazing place. One of the, one of the foundations of, of, of so many records, Led Zeppelin. And, oh yeah. Um, and then I got to work at Trident studios, Elton John did tons of recording there. And Gus Dudgeon was a producer that worked there. He was a good friend. And, Got to work at Air Studios and um, got to work at EMI, DECA, all these major landmarks, you know. And uh, and it was kind of like we just casually went there and worked like it was nothing to it, you know, yeah. later realizing what it was. We started a band uh, called Backstreet Crawler because f the band Free had broken up with Paul Rogers, the lead singer. Had broken up and the guitar player wanted to start his own band. His name was Paul Kossoff. And we were asked to play with Paul Kossoff and put a band together, um, see if we wanted to be a part of their thing with this band and whatnot. So Terry and I said yes. In the beginning, I didn't want to do it. Uh, I'm really glad I did. It became a great experience. And um, we made two records with Paul Kossoff on, on the Atlantic label, and we did a minor touring with the United States. And then Backstreet Crawler, there you go. That's it, yeah. Huh? Show the photos of my youth. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the photos of I your. Mind, I don't mind if you look at the album cover there. You can say whatever you want about what I'm wearing and my beard. So you know, but. <laughs> um, did you say photos of your youth? Oh my God! <laughs> Where did you get that? Oh, we have our ways. Oh my God! Tell us, tell us what this was. When and where? I don't know. <laughs> oh, I do know where I am. I like I'm the way you're kidding. studying it. You're studying it. <laughs> How did you get that photograph? I am across. I'm sitting by the window, and our our first apartment was on on Kings Road, Chelsea, and our second apartment was on. Oh, oh, what was the name of it? It was a major boulevard right off off of Kings Road. Mm. Oh, I'll remember it in a second. Anyhow, yeah. that's the Wellesley pub in the background across the street. And um, yeah, that was how I looked around that time. Curly hair with a beard. So you're whole, how guitar. old around there? 20s? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Early yeah. 20s, you know. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was cool, huh? But oh, you mentioned God. Backstreet Crawler and then... Paul passed away, right? Is that what happened? We did two albums on Atlantic, and uh, tragically, Paul had problems and the drug problems, straight up. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. I just can't. You can't hold back anymore about talking about things like that. It was tragic, and he. If I say all along that if the amount of twelve-step program support there is and, and psychological help there is around today were existed at that time for Paul. It's it's a chance he could have lived and, and gotten some help, but he was troubled with it. And there was nobody, you know, people were, you know, they were using regular old means of, oh, please don't do this. You're going to die. That, that doesn't work. You know, you got to get into somebody's head. It's a sickness. And he had it and he was addicted. And um, God, should I tell this story? Yeah, we'd come to do our second record, um, and and we were in, in Los Angeles, and we were finishing up, and we got on a plane that night to, on a red eye to go to New York to do some promotion the next day at, at Atlantic in New York, and we were taking the record home, and 
Glenn Johns is going to mix it. And we were all excited about all of that. And we got on a plane and that night, uh, Paul died on the plane. So uh, whether he took his life or whatever, there are no details. And, but he disappeared from where he was sitting next to me from, from where we took off. Crazy day. I'm not going to go into all the details, but um, that we threw a whole yeah shift into uh, your lives too, your friend and your comrade, and you know uh, and we had to try to keep face and go into the record label, and of course we were sad and crying and everything, but in shock. But what do we do? So they were still going to release the record, and uh, we were we searched around for record uh, for a guitar player to take his place and. You know, uh, we had some pretty famous guys that were pretty close to being in the band. And because of Paul's fame, the record label wanted us to have somebody of that level. And we tried and, and it just didn't work out that way. We found a guy who was right for the band and they the label stalled out on us for a little while after that release of that record. And it wouldn't give us a release from our contract and said they were going to hold us up for the next record. And, you know, it's typical record company stuff, from, especially from that era. And, um, uh, then we managed to get out and find the right lawyer in London, whom I wish he was still alive. I love that man. Um, and we got a deal with CBS. We met a new manager one night at Robert Stigwood's house and playing pool. And my comrade, Terry Wilson and I had beat him and his friend on pool about six games in a row and he couldn't stand it. He kept trying to beat us and he goes, I like you guys. So next thing you know, he's our manager. <laughs> <laughs> There's always these connections and stories. And, <laughs> and Abe Hawk became our manager. God bless you, Abe. I wish you were watching this. I would only tell the truth about you. Um, <laughs> so we got. Uh, we is got, he still with us? Abe is. He lives in the Midwest. I forget where. He, Nebraska. Send him the link. He can watch in the archives. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> I'll be happy you mentioned his name. <laughs> yeah, Abe's living on a golf course now. Come on, play golf with me. Sure, I'd love to. But, you know. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> We got a, a record deal and we made two records on uh, CBS and they treated us really good as well. And they thought that we were, you know, the bee's knees at the time. And we went on the road and opened up for big acts like Kansas and Foreigner and Robin, Robin, uh, brrr, what was his name? My, my memory's going. I'm sorry. No, it's, it's everybody. Yeah. It's just, so, yeah, exactly. It's a lot going on. Busy days. <laughs> yeah. And also COVID didn't help. We just got reason. through this pandemic thing. Yeah. Pandemic memory. <laughs> no. Yeah. But, uh, we, we did pretty well with that and made two records and we were going to make our third one. And then something just kind of split up, you know, rabbit w was asked to go with the who and he couldn't turn that down. Nah, and, yeah. uh, and so Terry and I were kind of getting homesick for being back in Texas and, seeing how that would work if we could get back onto the roots a little bit. And we got back to town, uh, Texas. And, um, that was like, I think I finally moved back in 79 and, and, um, moved there in 74, moved back in 79 and tried to, uh, resume similar activities of what we were doing and bring our experiences to, to Houston. And once again, we were met with the same type of overall, non-enthusiastic local demeanor and i love everybody there and i loved all the musicians and it was no one's fault it was just a way of life there they you know you the studios weren't as as advanced as what we had been and we'd become used to in new york and los angeles and terry and i both learned a lot about how to record i mean it really you get down to it. We put together most of the music for those bands for Crawler and Backstreet Crawler. And, and whether it was writing, Terry did a lot of writing. And I spent a lot of time in the studio with the engineers and stuff like that. And I would often hang out for hours and days afterwards and be a part of that just to make sure that process would go. Little did I realize that that was my training for later on in life. That's right. And for Terry as well. He's still making records. We're both still making records. And um, decided then that was it. And uh, I remember playing, we were playing a little four piece kind of Americana soul, R&B, half country singer songwriter band in Houston, Texas with a great singer songwriter by the name of Danny Everett. And uh, Danny's still writing songs, living in Texas. Uh, great, great artist. And um, Jimmy Don Smith and Terry and I 
I said one night at the end of the show, I said, hey, guys, um, my notice tonight, I'm leaving them in the next week or two and going to Los Angeles. Really, why? Well, don't don't ask that question, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> you really got to ask a question like that now. Yeah, and right. So, um, so um, we, uh, I took off in my car, and um, uh, I think we actually went. No, I drove out in my car. And uh, Terry came out in his car. Jimmy Don came out in his car with Danny. Danny came out. We, everybody showed up, and you know, people started out sleeping on couches. I ended up sleeping on my best friend's couch, Willie Arnellis, and he introduced me to people in Los Angeles. And I carted his drums around so that I could meet people in nightclubs and recording sessions and studios. And I was had left a kind of a lofted position as you know rock star over in, in England to just bare minimum again and yeah and it was yeah. starting all over and uh and it was it was fun it was thrilling i yeah. didn't i wasn't scared so um that's how i got going here and started playing around and uh the first thing that i really came upon that mattered was i was asked to by my best friend my best friend lewis another great friend lewis cabaza who now lives in san antonio brilliant keyboard player was living here and he said no man you need to be here i mm. said sure you know i'm of a caliber he goes no don't even mm -hmm. yes yeah. you need to be here and he yeah. gave me a lot of inspiration and when i showed up he already had worked for me and he so he helped out a lot and i played on the tonight show within the first like six or seven months of being here with this uh actress who'd done him uh, with uh, tonight show with carson yeah wow yeah. that must have been cool huh very very tense wow. and crazy and wild what a crazy story i, I you know you, you always get kind of uh what was that like because they always kind of say you kind of roasted or, or what what does it call when you join a, a fraternity you get uh oh you know uh you get you get uh it, it's you know, there's like they're they're put you put they put you through the ringer first. So right, yeah. I go, I go, <laughs> so to, you play, I go to play this song and uh, uh, the first song and uh, and um, the drummer um, had let me you know play on the drums at rehearsal and he said you can't move anything and he was a really tall guy, big guy. I'm not gonna mention his name because it sound it'll make me sound like he's you know not a nice guy. He's not with us any longer, but. Um, uh, I will admit it's Ed Shaughnessy. <laughs> and so Ed, I get up to play on the show and there was a very narrow exit to entrance to get up to the drum risers. I was up about three or four feet. You got to climb upstairs and I've got my two pieces of music in my hand and, um, I get up there and I was, and I mean, he waited all through the whole break on purpose. Yeah kind of to like put me through this little test and i get up there at the last minute and i see i see lewis he was conducting from the piano with the whole complete orchestra the whole complete was doc like, severance in there that night everybody doc, a, yeah. it. and um i've got my two sheets of music here and my drumsticks and lewis said that you know we have to be so quick with this you need two counts i'm not going to get tell you one two three four you're going to get three four downbeat top of the chart right there okay so i threw the charts down as i get finally ed finally lets me up i put the charts down on the floor tom sticks on top of the charts i reached down to move the snare drum down because it was up around my chest and i had to move it down just around my stomach and as i'm as, as i'm coming up from uh, fixing the snare drum lewis goes i'm doing it in slow motion this is what it felt like three four and in that in that three four those two counts i picked up the drumsticks and ended up over in the hi-hat playing this disco beat you know four four and at the end of the intro it stops on the fourth bar one of the arrangements does the other one doesn't i'm con there's an orchestra right now they're either going to stop or they're not depending on whether i had the right chart on the top or not and i wasn't sure and i play this intro as though I'm going to stop. I'm going to take the chance. And I stopped and the whole orchestra stopped. And I went, Oh my God. And I kept playing. <laughs> and I played the two songs and got through it. And I was so insecure after that. I, I went over to the bar and had a drink with Ed right away. You know, not Ed Shaughnessy. Uh, McMahon. Ed McMahon. Yes. Yeah. Hey, oh, he, he would be there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looks like you need a drink. I said, yeah, I do. You know, 
<laughs> did you get a chance to meet Carson or um, no, Fred DeCordova, the producer, or any of the other? No, uh, 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 who took his place afterwards? Uh, oh, somebody was filling in? Yeah, yeah, but who took his place for a long time afterwards, uh, the other comedian? Um, Jay Leno? Jay, Jay, and Jay, Jay was, was on that night. Yeah, Jay was on that night. I never got to meet Johnny. You know, that would have yeah. been a dream. Completely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. What a, but but what an experience. I mean, did you call back home to uh, the family in Houston and tell them I'm going to be on the Tonight Show? Yeah, but I was embarrassed because I thought I screwed it all up, you know. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get they're going to talk about me in this town. I'm through. And I and I called Willie that night, you know, because he was my best friend, my big brother, my mentor. And I said, Willie, I don't know, man. I said, he, he just laughs. He goes, oh, my God. It's probably good you went through that early on when you first get here. <laughs> yeah. Well, that happened to we had um, John Davidson. Of course, you remember John Davidson, the singer, talk show host, actor, the whole bit. He was, I think he's, I think the singer that has filled in for Carson the most, some 88 times filling in as host of The Tonight Show when Carson was out. And there is some video that's floating around and he talked about it when he was a guest on our show about when he had to perform, he forgot the words <laughs> and he kept forgetting the words and they had to keep restarting the band and keep restarting. And he's apologizing and the video is somewhere it's on YouTube or something and it's hilarious, but he was so like worked up about it because, you know, he thought he had that song down and he would get into it and start going. And then all of a sudden it was like mishmash of uh, right there on the, on the tonight show of all places. So it happens to the best of them, my friend. Oh, it, it happens to everybody. Everybody has a story like that somewhere. You know, I mean, you can't, you cannot be in something that is so spontaneous as television and not yes. that go on. You can't, you know, they happen in the studio. Okay. Uh, it might be on tape and maybe they saved it or, you know, for history or whatever, but you know, it, it, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't avoid those situations. And for me, fresh here, yes, uh, with really wanting to jump into the deep end of this of the scene here in Los Angeles and be, I wanted to be a session player. I wanted to tour with people that were, you know, that that I the music that I liked and whatnot. Yeah, it yeah. was a style of a, of a drummer that they wanted, and yeah. I was pretty broad in my styles, which is why I worked with people, you know, you know as broad as. Taj Mahal to Bette Midler to Ricky Lee Jones to Eric Burden to Bonnie Ray to, you know, to Robert Cray to blah, blah, you know, to, and, and then all the records I played. And I could play a lot of stuff. I could play reggae. as I could play some, you know, some cultural music, some reggae and some African stuff. I could always play country and go back to that. And I could play rock and roll because of what I had gone through in, 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 uh, in London. So yeah. that helps. You have to yes. be, you know, have all those. But, but those, those incidences are, Man, they're you, you they grow stick with you. Yeah, they stick with you, and you grow from them. And, and, and you I, grow. And I, right. you clearly, I clearly grew some skin on that. You know, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, you mentioned session musician. Did you play on the the background of uh, other like commercials or film music or TV music or any of that other? Because I know a lot of the session musicians get called to do themes and and commercials and uh they work with orchestras all of it did you uh, I, dabble I, in any of that i never really got to work with the orchestra my friend willie was on tons of uh of orchestra sessions you know i mean he, that was that was his main stay for quite a while he was on, and he worked on a bunch of tv shows which i can't you know were which were popular at the time and um played on the who, theme who was and, that again you were saying Willie Ornelas is my friend. He, uh, yeah. he's the guy I grew up with that sold me my first drum kit. Yeah, he's We're the one. Still, yeah. The best friends. I'm going to see him next week. He's living in Mexico now. So. Oh, that's awesome. You know who's uh, watching is Eddie Taduri, the Rhythm oh, Arts Project no. concert series. Yeah, he was a guest on our show. And he goes, hi, Jim. You've got a great friend today. Say hi to Tony for me. He was awesome on the show. And you, you know, what's really cool, it's actually a compliment you thought you were on this show once before, but you were actually watching T-Bear when he was on the show. That's right. And, and I, I take that as a compliment. It felt like, I guess the show gave off a vibe, like you thought you were in the living room with us, just chatting <laughs> around a table, a coffee table and uh, <laughs> shooting the breeze. Wait, I, I thought, it, wasn't I on the show already, Jim? <laughs> I, just, I just got a text from T-Bear and I wrote back and said, I'm on the Jim Master Show, leave me alone. 
And, <laughs> um, and then he, and, and the, and the text was with he and Lawrence Juber. And Lars Juber was a guest too. Another classic. Yeah. Both of them just said to tell you hello. And, um, uh, we're working on, um, T bears next record together, uh, and at Lawrence's studio and my studio. And we just recorded, uh, uh, don't let me forget to go back to talk about Eddie Tadori. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just recorded a song called, I'm going to give you the title, but it's going to be out soon. It's called Red Harvest. It's about Ukraine. Oh, and we're going to, perfect. You know, use the song to promote yeah. some good things, hopefully, for the people of Ukraine. And um, it's my, needed. Yeah. my blessings and love go out to all of those people. It's It's very much needed right now. Absolutely. Yes. Every day seems to just get worse and worse. It's crazy stuff. Uh, and I'm right there with you. Uh, you mentioned some of these cool names and there's some albums and things of that nature that you've been a part of with them, like Ricky Lee Jones and this album here. What was it like uh, being working with Ricky Lee Jones? Oh man, it was amazing. I was thrown into the deep end uh, on that. I, I, I was, uh, she was looking for a drummer in a band and uh, every guy in town went by and went guy to, to play. And, and near the end of the week, a friend of mine that was over at Warner brothers, who'd seen me play with some of the bands, local bands around town when I was playing with what we call showcase bands. And I was doing a tiny bit of studio work and whatnot. And I'd already been, I got the Eric burden gig for a little bit, but it wasn't a real extensive Eric. Well, when we I'll take it back, we went to, we worked around the, the country a little bit and then we went to uh, Australia and we did some recording with Eric Burden and I've had, that's been a friendship ever since uh, I ended up later on producing three records on him. But yeah, I got the call for Ricky from a friend of mine who was working um, liaison with um, Warner brothers. And um, he said, Hey man, I, you could try out for this thing. So I looked at the music and I realized that Steve Gadd was the drummer and, that is a study in itself. That's going to school because he's one of my favorite drummers. And I just did my homework and I went in and played and uh, I got asked back. That was a Saturday. I was the last guy at the end of like seven or eight days of, of auditions. And I got asked back for the Monday and I went back Monday. And then there, there was another famous drummer whose name I don't want to say because of what the outcome was. He's a good friend of mine now. He came in while I was on the, the audition, the re-audition on Monday. And I I was then, I was crestfallen. I'm going, I didn't know somebody else was coming. I thought I was the only guy. And of course, this guy's famous. And uh, he comes in and I look at him and I went, hey, good luck, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he lasted for for some time and then four or, five, four or five days. And then Ricky said, I don't know, this, I, this what's going on here? Uh, you know, and the key, and keyboard player was a good friend of mine that I was working with around town and other bands. His name is Mike Ruff. He's now, he's a brilliant songwriter. Yeah. And Mike uh, said, well, Ricky, maybe you should come see Tony play in a band situation where he knows what he's doing. So I was playing on a Saturday night gig at a bar over in Venice called the blue lagoon. And mm. the leader lead singer of the band was Katie Seagal. Oh yeah. yeah. And very famous. Married she with was, children. Yes. And, and others and others. And, yeah. And she was a brilliant singer still is. She still does. She still works around town and still, you know, makes a uh, great actress as well. So Ricky came to see us play and I knew all of those songs and I was really confident. And she saw me play. She saw me in a situation where I knew it was going on, sat there on the edge of the stage. Normally would have made me nervous, but I went, I, I don't care. I don't get, I'm not, I'm not getting this gig, you know? And, um, she sat there and afterwards she said, can we go talk? And we went and talked and got to know each other. And she says, <laughs> she says, uh, as I walked her to the car, I said, okay, good night. Take care. And she goes, yeah, thank you. And I said, uh, she goes, Hey, wait a minute. Well, will you come back and audition for me again? And, <laughs> and, and in my little bravado of the moment, I went, well, you know, Ricky, I, I don't want to come back and audition, but I'll come back and play drums for you if you want. And she liked that confidence, I guess. And so I, I was back the next day and I walked in on the other guy mm. and it was awkward for a minute. Uh, oh yeah. But like I say, later on when we talked about it, it was like, you know, <laughs> high five. Oh, this is crazy. You know? And I, d I did the gig and I went back that day and we played and we played for about 20 or 30 minutes. And, and, and uh, the, the key, the guitar player, nobody was sure they were getting the gig. Everybody had been rehearsing. And, uh, you know, uh, 
a typical Hollywood thing, I guess, in some ways. Well, the artists are like that. Sometimes they're, they're really looking for something. They want to, they want to know that one special thing is happening for them. And Ricky was looking for that. And, and then a guitar player said, uh, in his Boston accent, hey, Ricky, I don't know if you're going to hire the rest of us or whatever here, but, you know, if you don't hire this drummer, you're crazy. <laughs> and uh, That sounded yeah. like a little bit of Cagney there. <laughs> right, not quite, but anyway, I didn't know. <laughs> hey, Ricky, Boston, park the car. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she, she said, uh, she goes, yeah, you're right. Everybody, boom, she closed the piano lid down. She goes, this is my new band, and here are the rules. And Ricky talked like she had a Brooklyn accent, even though she was like from Arizona or someplace like that. So um, that was it. Then we had next thing you know, I'm going, oh, my God, I'm going on the road with Ricky Lee Jones. And uh, we had, man, I had so much fun musically because she she likes things a certain way, but she wants you and your soul and your heart to show up as well. So that meant there was a tiny little bit of a freedom of expression within the realms of where the songs and the compositions lie. And, and um, man, it was fun. We had a great time. Yeah. Got asked back to go out again the following yeah. year. So I got two great, uh, two great tours out of her. And the second one was even better. It was even mm. better. Just with the band turned into, went from four horns to of two horns to four horns. And by then the rhythm section was were her background vocals i and i was singing some background vocals as well and so we were all up there just really digging into this whole thing and everybody that came to see it were, were flipping out you know mm. and, uh, later on i worked with bonnie Raitt. she told me i saw you play at universal with ricky that was an amazing show and later on i worked with bet miller and bet miller said i saw you play with ricky lee jones and that was an amazing show you know, tell us about that too. Working with uh, Bette Midler, what was that oh, like? Oh, look at her face! Oh, yeah, huh? she's adorable, man. She's wonderful. You know, how uh, that opportunity come your way, Tony? Um, I was sitting on the couch the night before, going, "Oh, uh, <laughs> significant other. Oh, uh, doesn't look like I got a tour this summer right now." Jeez. Because that's what it would happen. You get a call in February, March, April, or springtime or whatever, and they'd be putting bands together, going on the road with, with artists like this. And that was kind of the model back then. So I haven't got any calls, and I got two or three of my friends are on this gig, and a couple of them are on that gig. And, man, I was, wow. Well, okay. Phone rings. It's a friend of mine says, hey, you want to go do the uh, Bette Midler gig? I said, mm -hmm. what are you talking about? Bette Midler gig? <laughs> what? <laughs> Sure, he was on it. And he said, wow. well, she's changing drummers, and I would put your name in. Come on over and play tomorrow. And I went, okay. And I got to the rehearsal room over in Hollywood, and I, I'm, I don't know any of the music or anything. I'm sitting there playing a little bit, and we are learning some songs. And I had known Bette before because she dated a friend of mine that, had, that I was in another band with. And so I got to hang out with her, like, a, like friendly, like, you know, how you doing, Bette? You know? Yeah. And, um, uh, around Hollywood and some clubs and stuff like that. And, and he was dating her and, and because I was in the band, she knew me and we got to be sort of friends. And yeah, that first day of rehearsal, she walks in kind of late after at being at a rehearsal with all the dancers and she walks up to the stage. She does her little sidle, you know, every newbie she's in, she's got this little walk. The wiggle walks. there. Yeah. So cute. And she wa waddles up, wiggles, whatever, wiggle waddle up to the stage <laughs> and looks at me and she goes, Tony Bronigle, where have you been? And I said, I don't know. I've been waiting for you to call me, Bet. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I did it and had a wonderful tour. We, they, they treated us wonderfully. So she, uh, as as the, the the principal and the the artist and and the the, the main act and everything, she was always very uh, appreciative of the the. Uh, the attention uh, to detail and the care and the passion that musicians use playing her music. And yeah. she didn't take it for granted. And she always yeah. helped us out and told us, you know, complimented us and everything. And if something wasn't right, she, you know, she'd say something and we'd work on it. And because yeah. she was so nice to us, you'd do anything for her. So I have nothing but a, a wonderful memory of working with Bet for like about a three and a half month tour of the summer mm -hmm. and four months, something like that. Bonnie Reed as well, huh? Oh, Bonnie, 
Yeah, Bonnie had heard about me before, and she was replacing her drummer. Uh, he was leaving the band, and so who do I get? Where do I go? What do I do? And she asked a few of the guys in the band, and one guy in the band, my good friend Marty Greb, who's no longer with us, unfortunately, was in the band, and he said, I know a drummer you should get. This guy will fit right in. His name is Tony Bronigal. So she got in touch with me and said hi. I said, I'm playing tonight with Etta James down at the uh, Vine Street Bar and Grill in Hollywood. <laughs> that this alone is... requires a pause. I'm playing oh, I'm, with Etta James yeah. down the road. I mean, <laughs> not too shabby. Greatest queens of soul, of blues and soul of all time in a tiny little jazz bar, you know, on a Monday night, you know, mm. and the place is packed. I'm playing with Etta James. I don't care. I'm fine now, you know, broke. I don't care. I'm playing with Etta James, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like a pinnacle, really. And um, I said, well, I'm playing down the street here if you want to come see me play. And so her and her bass player and one of the other guys showed up at the bar and they sat there and they're watching me play. And they, I went over and met Bonnie and, hey, how you doing? Great to meet you. And blah, blah, blah. Yeah, we're thinking we're going to do some gigs. And are you interested? And yeah, you know, I, I thought I had the gig. and craziest thing that happened that night though is i go out to get in my car and it had been broken into and it was my bag had been stolen because i stupidly left it in it and we didn't have cell phones back then but you had um I, my phone book was like an inch and a half two inches thick i had everybody's phone number and i was the guy who always kept you know everything in there yeah in, in my phone book is what i wanted forget the 150 dollars cassette player you know and all the other stuff um in the headphones uh, i just wanted that book back and i went looking around for it kind of foolishly in the neighborhood and uh i'm not going to get into any more details but i got mugged by five guys right outside the club and um and um uh, they took the flashlight out of my hand and used it on my head and <laughs> My life nearly went out that night. <laughs> that was that was just a oh, Etta James, Death, and Bonnie Raitt. You know? <laughs> man, there's no way we could have like jumped over the bridge there. I just go through this like, without like nearly dying, you know? <laughs> Your death experience of uh, from Bet at Bet Middle. Uh, sorry, Etta James to, to Bonnie. Wow. Ray. And I I was pretty beat up for a while, and Bonnie took me anyhow, and uh, I did. Um, that was the beginning of eight years with Bonnie. And yeah. God, I had a ball playing with her. She's still a good friend, like a she's like a sister. She's wonderful. We got very close, and and we made a lot of great music together. And um, yeah, I, I didn't get to play on all of those records as the guy, the principal guy. You know, some other there's a producer and other people and other decisions involved. But I got to play on some uh, pretty strong songs. I'll say the most important song that I got to play on of hers, and probably one of the most important songs in my life is a ballad that she uh, did um, called I Can't Make You Love Me. Oh, yeah, sure. And it's so touching. You cannot be breaking up with somebody and listen to that song. You will no. be reaching for the tissues. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I got to play on that, and it was kind of a, a last minute. I was being called to play on another track, and I played on uh, – I got as I was getting there, the producer came out. Oh, no way. Sorry. The producer came out and said, hurry up. I need you right now. <laughs> Don't you wish you had come up with that little cue there? That guy Imagine probably, made, he might have made a fortune. Da -da 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 I mean, I mean does, he get paid every, does he get paid every time? Like, you know. Could you imagine? Spotify scale, you know. <laughs> I know the guy who used to do the uh, Verizon commercials. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you yeah, hear me now? Right. He really? was an actor out of New York, Connecticut area. And he did yeah. those for 11 years. And he banked all the money. And then when Verizon made the switch to not, you know, I guess a different thing, different way they were doing it. Uh, I think it was what Sprint hired him <laughs> to do a take on that by saying, can you still hear me now? <laughs> but wow, then you come up with a great segue in your career. Say, wow. I tell you, but to come up with something little thing like that or Honda, what is Honda? It's just two piano keys, isn't it? Da -da. And then it Something like that. starts yeah. the Honda commercial. I mean, imagine sitting there. Uh, I know a lot of composers I've worked on uh, with some of them. I've never composed for film. I've played on some, you know, in some small 
levels I've played on some, well, not small levels, but I haven't been like in the big band, uh, you know, that played on, on film scores, but I played in combos, you know, um, and, and played on stuff that was in movies and, and, and TV. And I played on a lot of jingles for a little while there. I was one of the guys that got called at nine yeah. o'clock. You show up and you do a 30 second and a, and a uh, 60 second and you're out of there by yeah. 10. You I've know. always loved jingles. I, I wish they would bring them back because I think they really created a warmth and a connection mm -hmm. with people and brands and yeah. TV stations, radio stations, all of it. There was just when you heard, I mean, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 60s, everything. They would sing about the soap, about the dish detergent, yeah. about the car, about the TV station. It was all singing about it. And I think it was kind of cool. It just created some sort of a connection and a warmth. Do you recall some of the ones you worked on? No, uh, oh, not Jesus. Oh, I did. Uh, what was one? I did a Honda one and it, it played for about two or three years. And then I did, we did another version of a Honda one. I was, I was on, was rerunning on a Honda one for quite a while. Um, and I can't even remember the music. Uh, and then there was another one that was, um, Remember Burgess Meredith used to do those commercials for Honda? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that fabulous voice. There was another one I, I was on that would have ran for about a year and a half. And then um, uh, and then it kind of fizzled off. You know, you become uh, become the, the guy for a while, you know, and then, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, and, then, then. and then it goes away. And I'll, I'll tell you what kind of killed it for me is a friend of mine in Las Vegas was running a, a chain of hotels. And he said, and we were at the bar one night after a show in Vegas, and he goes, we're having a beer. And he goes, uh, hey, uh, I want you to write the next jingle for this property here. And I said, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. The mic, I, he goes, I don't do that. I play on him. He goes, what do you mean? Of course you can write it. And I went, well, yeah, I can write. I can write songs. And so, oh, you mean something 60 seconds long or 30 seconds long? Okay, I'll give it a go. So I, I wrote, I wrote uh, for two or three or I think three different properties that the that the chain held in uh, in Las Vegas, and the the hotels are still there. Something Station and the stations, you know, those hotels in Vegas. Uh, what are they called? Uh, Boulder Station and another one. But anyhow, I wrote them and I produced them. And they were being used on the radio and it yeah. was all legal and every file and people were getting paid and so on and so forth. And, and then I went to one of the guys that I had been working with that was producing jingles. And I asked him a question about the business. I said, Hey, you know, I, I'm writing some jingles right now and, and producing a couple of things. And I, I just want to ask you a question when you blah, blah, blah. And I thought he was a friend. What I didn't realize is that when I told him that I was writing and producing jingles, even though he, we were friends, he never hired me again. I became his competition. Wow. And I, went, I can't compete with this guy. He's huge. He's a jingle house, you know. Mm -hmm. But kind of so like uh, Ron Hicklin, the Ron Hicklin singers. Yes, yeah, just thing after thing after thing. Backup singers, commercials, yeah. all of that big, big area. But so you did uh, play in the the jingle world then for a while. It was yeah, kind of cool. Well, huh? it, it was, it was fun. I, you know, I, I enjoyed it. It was quick. It was in and out. It yeah. Was musical. It wasn't like, it wasn't as creative. Well, it was creative from the writing end. Cause but I you had to, to get it all in, in 60 seconds. Yeah. yeah. That was really tough. I remember the first one I produced, I, I, I mixed it and I, and I, I, I put a really, really slight fade at the end of it. Bah! Like that. Yeah. And I sent it back to the client and he went, what are you doing? Fading? I said, I didn't fade it. He goes, yeah, it fades. I want 30 seconds all the way. I want to stop. I want him to turn it off. I went. So you wanted like a big finish or something? No, like you just boom? don't want the audio to go away. And I had, I had oh. tagged the audio just a slightly in the last literally second and a half. Not, not like a song fade for radio. And I'm going, I've already finished this. He goes, I want 30 seconds. So that was my first uh, round with Pro Tools. I heard about Pro Tools when you can digitally put something into um yes take a file and put it in and you can start to manipulate it and yeah. it was so primitive i looked at it with my eyes like a gog like what, what what's <laughs> going on here? what are you doing with my audio because everything was on tape that i had and we dropped this audio in and we got to the end of the 30 second and the 60 second that i put that second and a half fade on 
and he was able to drag the 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 uh, the wave and pull it all the way to the end. Isn't that cool? That yeah. was that cool. Wow. What do I owe you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I paid the guy for his time, his Pro Tools time, and I saved myself and I went back and I fixed it. And then the guy's like, uh, how did you fix that? <laughs> Remember splicing the reel-to-reel -reel tapes and oh, all the, the cart machines with the carts and having to take the carts out and then clean them with that in that sort of yep. Q-tip thing. And oh, yeah. You keep <laughs> working in broadcast, we did a lot of that. <laughs> and then setting the azimuth for the machine, for the for the heads and everything. You put the cart in and somebody before you were supposed to clean the cart machine, but they didn't. You put the cart and next we have blah, blah, blah. Whoa, 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 oh, while boy. you're live on the air. <laughs> and yet to this day, it, it, uh, analog tape is my favorite sound. You know, oh, uh, I, absolutely. Produced, I produced something last. Uh, yes, uh, I produced something in Kansas City, and we, the artist wanted to go to analog tape. Danielle Nago Cole is her name. She's wonderful. I got a Grammy nomination. We got a Grammy nomination in 2019, and she's an amazing artist, incredible songwriter, bass player. Yeah. A warrior, just just on fire. Yes. And, um, she wanted to do it with her band, a road band, and she wanted to do it in analog. And I'm going, hmm, challenges. Okay, let's go. So we uh, we went in the studio, and it sounds fantastic because yeah. that that warmth and the warmth and, and the yes. saturation of of yes. the tape. Yes, I I've been listening to cassette tapes that I made and that mm -hmm. I purchased. I have thousands of them, and just listening to them, and you know they'll go for 120 minutes or 90 minutes full un uninterrupted, and they sound so good. Yeah. And then bringing out the vinyl too, because I still have my Ankyo turntable and receiver and double cassette deck and the KLH speakers, because I like my music to fill the house. I don't like it shoved in my ears yeah. with little earbuds and all that stuff i like it bouncing off the walls i like it surrounding me sure. and and that's a whole lot you need that kind of equipment for that and i still still have it and still use it but it does look as though vinyl is making a comeback we, we have a climate controlled uh monthly payment to <laughs> a storage unit that has other things in it you know things from my career like tape and video and things you don't want to ever lose in a fire and a flood and family photos and eight millimeter, all this, but lots of records too, and tapes and reel to reel and all of that is in there as well. And we just, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, there's, at the, there's um, at the top of that storage there, there's a whole bunch of tapes, two inch and, and, and quarter inch mixes and stuff. And then I've got about 300 uh, or 400, you know, pieces of vinyl, a lot of them stored in the garage and yeah, and then we've got two turntables and, um, one here in the studio and one around in the other living room. So you can play, you know, for friends coming over and have another place to play something and compare sounds and noises. Toby's it, here. She says you've produced many artists and still continue to bring it. Yeah. You're producing a lot of other artists as well as a prolific producer. I, I started out right around 98 wanting to produce. And I walk, you know, I remember saying to my good friends that were already famous producers and engineers, Hey man, I'm going to start producing. They all looked at me like, yeah, right. Sure you are. And little by little, I just kind of stayed after it until I got my feet wet a few times and fell backwards a few times. And, uh, 98, I produced uh, a live record at the mint. It's a club in LA. Taj Mahal wanted to make, I'd been on the road with Taj from like 94, 95 and Taj wanted to make a live record and, and with the band. And so we went into the mint and did three nights, two shows a night. And, I ended up uh, as the producer because the so, the so-called so producer was supposed to, but he didn't show. There were there was some misunderstanding between management and so and so forth, business stuff. So I took <laughs> over and I got it recorded. And I they wouldn't give me the budget for uh, to have reels of tape. I had two twenty-four track machines in the back there, and and in the back of the well, there was one, and I was going to rent one in the back of the mint right in, in, in the back room and they wouldn't let me do it so i had to do it on what was called uh adats back then mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> i did it on adats and um i took all of the live i, I ran a i've never done anything like that before i ran a, a a dat player the whole time anybody was near the stage so we wouldn't miss one note or one word and i had hours and hours and hours of that and at the end of the three nights, I took home 105 um, uh, 
105 takes from the three nights and I had to go through and make, you know, copious notes uh, detailed as well uh, of all of the takes and figure out the best ones. And it took me, I didn't work on it every day, but it took me close to a year to get it finished. And then I got Taj to re-sing a few and I mixed it down to 12 songs and released it. And uh, it was on Hannibal Records, and it came out, and it uh, got a Grammy nomination, and won a Grammy. So that's my first and only win as a Grammy. Um, um, but what was that like when music. you got it? I mean, that's that's you know, in the music industry, that's like the icing on the cake. That's the oh, man. that's it. You know, the top of the mountain. Uh, what was yeah. that like for you when that happened? That'd well, be extraordinary. You, you can't believe it when you're when it's announced, you know. <laughs> you, did you call the folks back home in Houston again and say, "Hey, yeah. guess what? From the yeah. Tonight Show to the Grammy." <laughs> <laughs> right. Remember when you said, "Go get a straight job." And you were a kid. Okay, well, watch me tonight on the Grammys. No. Uh, uh, so um, they, um, it's like you had springs in your shoes when you when they when they announced it. I couldn't walk. I was bouncing up to the stage and. You get You're like floating and, on a cloud, yeah, really, on air. It was an unbelievable experience. And it went really good that night. And um, that was a lot of fun. I had a great time. And it, it, you know, my best friend who just passed away now two years ago, one of my best friends, Ed Cherney, was a brilliant engineer and, um, and producer. And mm. boy, he was a mentor for me. Yeah. He passed. God bless him. I love you, Ed. Yeah. He came up to me that night. He said, Tony Bronigle, drummer and Grammy dr- drummer and Grammy award winning producer. And I said, Oh, Ed, Ed, I always, always, <laughs> Oh, Ed, I don't know. Come on. He goes, no, this is going to stick with you it's, the rest of your life. It's what it is. Yes. And he was right. And, and it opened doors just by using that, that credit at the end of your yeah. name. And, um, yeah, I haven't won one since I've been nominated as, you know, something I produced has been nominated and I've played on, you know, so many, the all these, all these different. Yeah. Eric Burton too. Well, working we didn't get a, a Grammy with Eric, but boy, no. wow, what a what a great working experience. working with, yeah, classic man. He's this guy was responsible for. He was the fifth Beatle. He was the yeah. alternate Rolling Stone. He was the uh, he was the, the the British blues movement. You know, coming to the United States, he was responsible for so much. And you look at that face yeah. and the character in that photo, and he's got all of that character. It's he all was, there, yeah. He's a wonderful guy. I love him to death. And we got very, 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 very close. And he's healthy now. And he's he's moved out of the country. He's living comfortably with his beautiful wife. That's so. cool. Yeah. yeah. Look at him. God, he was a punk. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> look at this one. Oh, Lord of mercy. They made a movie about this guy. Um, Terry, and, but right before we moved to California, this is one of the people we were working with. He's, he's like kind of... Uh, a legend in texas uh folk you know uh, yep. Foley. and was it ethan hawk that made a movie about him ethan oh. hawk i believe yes pretty yeah. i lived i lived if you watch the movie i lived through that i was living during and through that that period really yeah you know a number of people have been asking also about uh taj mahal and being involved with taj mahal tell us uh about that and of course uh this fabulous group phantom blues band too yeah it was my brothers yeah yeah you know taj mahal we were introduced to him by uh, a producer by the name of of john porter he's an english uh, producer who was living here and he loved seeing our band play around town uh, this the that basic rhythm section that you saw in phantom blues band a different keyboard player and whatnot but um we got hired on a lot of his records that he was producing and he would end up producing um, Taj Mahal and Buddy Guy and Keb, Keb Mo and people like that and Otis Rush and so we played on a lot of his things and and uh, when we played on the Taj record something really clicked with us and Taj and Taj walked in and said you guys speak my language you know we have a dialogue here and he loved it so we played on this next record and the first one was called Dance in the Blues and then the second we, record we played on was called Phantom Blues and around that time they wanted us to he wanted to have a band like this to, to go and um, uh, on the road with him. And um, so we became, they said, what's the name of the band? And Taj named us, uh, call them the Phantom Blues Band. Mm. 
And then we did, after the Phantom Blues, we did Senior Blues, another album. Now, all of these records were nominated for Grammys. Senior Blues won a Grammy. There's Bonnie. Oh, it's Lord. Bonnie, huh? This is during COVID. Uh, yeah. This is March 3rd, 21 in, in Berkeley Theater, uh, theater on, on the Berkeley campus. That's John Cleary all the way on the right. My great friend from New Orleans. What a brilliant songwriter and player he is. And uh, he's been in several uh, different versions of the Phantom Blues Band touring along also, not at the same time, but also with the, the wonderful Mike Finnegan, who left us last year. And um, yeah. we're still grieving over that. Oh, yeah. With Bonnie in the middle and Larry Fulcher just to her right and Joe Sublette, the saxophone player, who's out with Kenny Wayne Shepherd right now. And uh, that that our nucleus has been together for quite a while. Taj named us. We went, when Taj started, there's, yeah, that's Curtis Salgado, second from the right. That's an artist that I produced three albums on. Uh, kind of brought his career back into the limelight uh, in the blues community. And uh, he started getting nominations and winning awards after we made it with this. It's not me. It, it's, I, I'm the kind of the guy that often turns on the light and gets things started. But it's all of the talents of every single one of these people you see there and every one of them. If you put everybody's, uh, uh, you know, credits together from Hendrix to Bob Marley to uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan to famous jazz, blah, 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 and uh, Ronnie Wood. I mean, you know, and, and it just intertwines so much. And there's there's hundreds of years of experience with all of these guys playing together. And um, but with Taj, we became the guy that could help him interpret what he needed to do from country blues to jazz. And that's a pretty long throw right there. Yeah, it is. And um, we go on stage and, you know, we know the songs, but, you know, be ready for anything, you know. So, yeah, yeah we uh, that was that's my favorite album cover of our Phantom Blues. That's a, that's a that's a piece of art right there. That is a great one. Yeah. That was a show. We were looking for that blue note jazz from. The yes. Sixties kind of vibe, you know. Right. Exactly. And uh, the designer came up. Oh, look, there's Joe. Okay, the first guy's Mark Pender. And then uh, Whipper, the drummer from Kenny Wayne Shepherd. Chris Layton is his name. And then Joseph Blett. And then uh, that might be Kenny in the blue cap. And then the other guys, oh, yeah, there's a singer at the end and the keyboard players in there as well. That's them on the road. Right out. They're out there right now. Are they really? Yeah. Inside Out, another great, you know. It, you know, if you pick up the three Phantom Blues Band records that Mike Finnegan are, are on them, you're going to hear. I, I can say this, and I mean this, and I'm and I like I say I grew up with Ray Charles and Bobby Bland and the likes of that, and I've played with some amazing singers. But I have to tell you that Mike Finnegan didn't get the recognition he deserved. He is as he is. I think he's on um, the level of those types of singers. I, I, and I don't mind saying that. I don't care what anybody says, you know, it's like I, I witnessed how this guy moved the molecules in the room and nobody, oh, yeah. nobody could do it quite like him. Merlin in Ontario had a question. Were you with uh, him on further on the road? Further on down the road. Uh, the later version. Yes. On the maestro yeah. version. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're on that. Yeah. yeah. Cool stuff, Merlin. I know you're excited about hearing that. Isn't that cool? Really fantastic. I mean, you're, you're, it's an extraordinary career, and you, you love what you do. Uh, are you transported to another place when you get behind those drums? I mean, songwriter, producer, and drummer, is there – what pulls at your heart first? Are you the songwriter? Are you the drummer? Are you the producer? Or is it all equal for you, Tony? They become – equally important to each other. They all intertwine at a certain point. I started out as a drummer and what got me turned on the most was playing the music and being importantly a part of the music as a drummer. So as I made the band sound good, yeah. I grew up around a lot of older, tough guys, tough musicians that yeah. like put you through the ringer a little bit. Like, come on, shorty, come on. Let's, let's come on. go. Yeah. Yeah, and I was always the youngest guy in the band. I was 18 years old going to my second year of college playing in a 10-piece soul band six nights a week, but I was still going to college. Yeah. And, um, I, I, you know, I had to play. I, 
I went to, I went to it the hard way, you know, and I never studied music, you know, later on I studied a little bit, but I got through it all without doing that. And so, um, and then, um, I, I felt the, the music and the composition part of it. And I understood that what, what it made me feel like to hear a great song. And so I started, I could play three chords and I could go, you know, and write a song. And, and, uh, I, I didn't nurture it as good as some other friends of mine did who really, really turned into great songwriters. Uh, Terry turned into a great songwriter. He still stays after it a lot more than I do. And, um, but I started putting it all together. Then when you play on enough records and you hear how things are done and you go into play in the studio for people and they hire you because you have a sensibility about how to make sounds a certain way, how to interpret things, how hard to hit them, what tone to have of the snare drum or the overall drum kit and the attitude so that the atmosphere fits the song and the singer. The most important things to do. And any drummer that doesn't pay attention to that is playing for himself and he's probably not going to get hired as much. But the, but the drummers that play for making everybody sound good, they get the jobs. And that's why it all mixes together for me. And when producing came up, I went, well, this seems to be an obvious lateral move for me to build on. And I made the lateral move and I, and I produced probably close to 40 records now and nothing, nothing big other than Dodge's <laughs> Grammy and Danielle's Grammy nomination and a whole bunch of blues <laughs> music award nominations. Your nickname should be humble Houston. <laughs> man, I just don't live it's a good in that. thing. It, it's refreshing, actually, in these businesses to well, meet. I can't live in that a, other. I can't live in no, that other. Place. It's a whole it's other weird, world. Weird, yeah. It's a weird place. You wanted to mention. I know you're going to play something for a few things for, for us, which we appreciate. But Eddie Tadura, you wanted to mention oh, something because <laughs> he's been commenting uh, throughout, and uh, he said that you produced rubbing shoulders with angels for trap yeah. Yeah. and uh you put the band together arranged the tune and directed the session brilliant and then played our show that year too which was cool huh at the, at the libero this past libero, year yeah I, I i got in touch with eddie and and he had written a song with our our great friend greg sutton they put it together and greg i work with and i love and it was i don't know i think eddie just thought well tony will you get involved and play drums on this or produce it or whatever and i went of course i will it's for a great cause and uh for the rhythm arts project that that eddie has has a he's has wings he's an angel okay you know he's been doing this for a long time and eddie and i go back to being in rock bands in england yeah and, Three bands He's a nice guy too, you know. Wonderful really nice guy. guy. Yeah. We were back when we were our craziness of our youth, and we were three rock bands on the same bus at the same time, uh, tra tra touring around England. So the stories get way <laughs> mentionable very fast. <laughs> and uh, so, but Eddie had asked me to do this, and I just rounded people up, and he said, "You want to play on this?" And I said, "No, you play drums on it. Come on, it's yours, man." So we got in the studio and. I, I just got the right people together. They were all they were all doing it for the right reasons for Eddie, you know, engineer Jerry Wilson on bass and his wife Teresa on keyboards and uh, and sang and you know we put the vocals all together in the back and we did the background vocals over here at my studio uh, with uh, uh, the people that were in in his band at the Libero and. Um, and then Johnny mixed it and we mastered it. And, and that's how we've ended up with this great song that, uh, that Greg and, and Eddie wrote. And, and once again, I'm just, I'm an enabler when it comes to that, you know I mean? Yeah. I, I just, I don't, I don't take all the credit for as a producer, like, Oh, I produced that. So it's, I'm responsible for every note. No, my job is to be in the room with great people and see that it goes the right direction. And I, I seldom say no. I mostly say, yes, bring that. Yes, all right, let's try all of this till we get to a point where it sounds right. You have to be, okay, you have to be smart enough in the first place to hire the right people and, and know that when you're hiring people that you're going to get results out of these people. You right, know? exactly. Yes. And so that, that, that's how the job works for me. I I, I just take credit for uh turning on the light and hiring the right people and, and listening to what they have to say and then hopefully interpreting it into the overall creation of the, uh, of the recording sound and, and content. You ever, um, 
Uh, did you see what uh, Eddie wrote? Don't tell him about the bus in England. <laughs> I want to say one more word about what you did that. No, never mind. Yeah. He won't tell me on air, but maybe yeah. if we're all breaking bread, he'll help. You guys can spill the beans. You I'll have be a, more than happy to tell <laughs> you. I'll be more yeah, than happy. Do you have photos too? We, we were looking to, we were trying to dig up the photos, but we just couldn't find them. You got those under lock and key. <laughs> I don't think I was of, of, of a mind to even take photos. To take there. the photos. I, to me, my yeah. life was a photo. I was not going <laughs> to take photos of it. I was. It, it was a movie, boy. We were yeah. in a movie, you know. I mean, yeah. Eddie and I, the fact that we're still alive and, and, still and all of that youth, that crazy youth. Our own time. So, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. You, so. Uh, you ever come across or work with, uh, he's a friend, uh, Greg Field? No. The drummer uh, Greg Field, who's married to Monica, oh, no. Man, Monica Mancini, Greg Field. Yes, I, I know. I know. I know the name Greg. Yes, I know. I know. Good uh, guy, too. I'm not, we're not friends, no. Yeah, good guy. He's uh, he's married to Monica, and which have made his father-in-law Henry Mancini. <laughs> not that's too, not a bad. That's not a bad. Uh, uh oh, not Eddie, a bad thing for a drummer to fall into. <laughs> I, I have the photos. I expect the check in the mail. He's got the photos. He took the photos. I guess. Hey man, you can't pull that mob stuff on me, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> that is. <laughs> That is really funny. Just because um, your last name ends with a vowel doesn't mean that I'm afraid. Yeah. I, <laughs> thanks, everybody, for these great comments. We've been showing the comments throughout as well. Um, Jen Barry is in Pennsylvania in Allentown, and she plays drums. And she says, Tony, my rap split on my Gretsch Blackheart bass drum. I have to rewrap it. Should I do it myself or send it, you know, send it away to have it done? Thanks, Jen. I've done it myself. It's very hard to get it really just right. Uh, a craftsman would be better to get it so that it doesn't buckle. Getting all the bubbles out is really hard. And then making the seam be exactly perfect is going to be a, a, a real challenge unless you are just really slow and methodic and smart and can do things like that. Uh, I thought I was when I did it and I did it and it, it's still on that bass drum, but I don't think it's easy. I think, um, you know, if you, it depends on where you live. If there's a, a local drum shop, that has a craftsman like that. They're kind of rare, but yeah. when you find a guy that can do that, I, I would let him do it. It would be worth it because in the long run, it's going to look so much better. And, you know, I, she's I just, in Allentown, Pennsylvania. So I'm thinking maybe Philadelphia or something, maybe you think. Yeah. yeah. Who's around Philly? Uh, there's, there are some drum shops up there. I would look around and find out where the big drum shop is and then ask the big drum shop. Where is the little drum shop oh, with the, the smart guys that fix things? Right. <laughs> Where's Sal and Stan and yeah. <laughs> Fred? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah well, we have a Stan here, Stan Kiawa at Pro Drum. He's one of those guys. You know, it's like He's something breaks. Like, Stan and Pro. <laughs> I have another couple of. I have another guy, Chris Hoyer, who works here as well. It's like, uh, Chris, will you take this? Anyhow, he's, he's refurbished things and fixed them up for me many times. So That is cool. But I'm very lucky. I'm endorsed oh. by Drum Workshop. Yes, and you they are. Excellent care of me and have been since the 90s. And uh, I, 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 I use the things that they create. And they also they created some things that I've I've asked for. And they always yeah. they always help me out. And John Good's a very, very good friend. I love him dearly. Great he's relationship. Great man. And so we have an incredible relationship. I have an incredible relationship with Sabian Symbols, and I've been with them since the second year they would. And um, I have to talk about my my endorsements, and they've taken such great care of me. I'm I'm a part of the family. I've never paid for a symbol since 19 blah, 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 70, uh, so 84, 85, yeah, 84. That's fantastic. And um, I've been with Remo Drum Heads since the same time, 82, 83, and I've been. Vic Firth. I've been playing Vic Firth drumsticks and he wrote me a letter and, and uh, when it was at 92 and said, when I was coming up, a lot of pe me, people helped me out and I, you're still, you know, working your way up into the business. And I just want to let you know, you'll be a Vic Firth drum artist for the rest of your life. You'll never mm. have to play another stick. And I've been with them forever. And so, you know, some uh, microphone companies and case companies and everything, SKB and I had AKG for a while, but those main four, oh, and Gone Bops Percussion, they take excellent care of me as well. So nice. I, it's funny. I just, I, I feel so fortunate. I don't yeah. take it for granted at all. Not at all. 
Now, with all of that, did you want to show us some of that? Did you want to play something uh, for us, uh, my friend? I'm that nervous. That was the home you, alone face you just made. Yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll, uh, you know, you tell me all, I, all I'm going to remember from this conversation is that I that you gave earlier. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Well, you can always isolate that. So today we were, oh, earlier we were talking nice. about... We we're talking about studios earlier and how it, it took boards and desks and and carts and uh, and racks and everything to make a studio happen. And I was, you know, I'm not going to tell you about where I live, but I was able to put this unit here up underneath that totally handles whatever I need to do here at home. And uh, I, this is my recording. This is my, this was my office, and it became my. And now we're going into the living room, and there's my wall of fame with. My favorite, Earl Palmer, Taj Mahal, John Lee Hooker, Bobby Bland photos. Um, the, this was a really nice um, living room. <laughs> and my girlfriend, who's so patient with this whole situation, was like, uh, you need a space during COVID. So there's a there's a upright piano over here. And I probably don't have enough light in here. I didn't think to put some spare lights in. But this is the room. And there's microphones everywhere and snare drums everywhere and cymbals everywhere on the floor behind me. So I have to walk carefully. And then I have to find a place to place this. I think this might. How does that work? That looks good. Yeah, you because you're going to be seated, right? Yeah. You can see my Grammy up there. Uh, are you Now, are you seated now? Because it's cutting off the top of your head. There you go. Yeah. So the drums are, this is one of the DW drum kits. It's uh, cherry mahogany are the shells, uh, the, the comp composition of the shells with a beautiful gold glitter uh, and uh, a lot of different uh, symbols sitting around here, you know. Um, and then I'll show you the floor over here. This is a battery of snare drum stacks. And um this is where I record. I like the sound of it. It's a, it's a it's a lofted ceiling, you know, that comes up like that, and uh, you have to watch the ambience. But if you if you control the ambience just right, it, it gives you a nice wooden warm sound, and everything kind of blows around. It, this might really kill the di the microphones. I don't know. Is it too loud? Uh, give it a couple of. I'll just play for a second, yeah. and then you, it and sounds then you good. Yeah, sounds Hold good. Here, okay. Yes. <laughs> We want more. We want more. That sounded awesome. <laughs> it kind of distorts the microphones on these old, but you know. But, but it uh, came through nice. It came, came really through okay. nice. Yeah, they're all going wild. You have anything else? Uh, they're all giving you claps and hot and very nice. And she, uh, Jen was playing with her drum kit along with you in Allentown, PA. Beautiful <laughs> kit. Wow, that's quite a setup from Maureen in Arizona. So, yeah, they're here. I don't know if there's anything you want to tickle us with. That sounded well, good. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, any requests? Hey, uh, Eddie Tadiri says, sounds great. Mary in Florida says, sounds great. Toby says, more claps from Gina. Love it. Uh, very nice from Kathleen in New York City. Good stuff. Um Guys, do you have any uh, requests or, or is there anything that you want to share? Anything that you, Tony, want to well, share? Yesterday, okay, yesterday I was, uh, a friend of mine is putting this track together. It's called Keepers of the Beat. And uh, there's a lot of New Orleans people involved with it. Uh, I played with quite a few of the names. Leo Nocentelli from The Meters and George Porter and and Ivan Neville is one of my, my brothers still. And um, so I have a big love for New Orleans music. And there's a, a, a beat called a Second Line in New Orleans, and it's it's done sometimes as a march. It's well, it is a march, but but it's done in a few different ways. But he composed a song, 
And then in one part of the song, he decided to do one of the verses as a reggae feel. And he's, he's mashing up a lot of different things here. And so in the middle of the arrangement, he goes, how do we get this to sound like reggae? I said, well, I play reggae on it. He goes, can you do that? So I went from, I went from, uh, uh, to, I went in between two different beats to get back to the, to the reggae to the second line. And I'll just play you the first eight bars will be the beat of the chorus. And then I'll finish the chorus. And then I'll go to the first half of the, the second verse, which is a reggae. And then I'll go to the second line. So I'll give you three different beats in this one composition that I played yesterday in the studio. Cool. So, All right. <laughs> marching band goes down the street you faded but i wanted the full 30 seconds <laughs> <laughs> that'll cost the extra gym <laughs> you better take up a collection from your uh levities that's right levities yes if you're enjoying this okay. episode uh consider doing a, a super sticker a super chat super emojis and chat live that helps support our show good that's idea good. i love that idea my friend um, so that's, that's quite a room you're in there, huh? That, that is your, uh, that is your comfort zone. That is your spot. Well, I, I've always thought this would be a great room to record in. And, uh, if you look at these ceilings, this is 1935, you know, that's wood from 1935, built in 1935 and, and plaster walls. And you, you might want to treat rooms like this of this size. But when you fill them up with furniture, or they're they're already full of furniture and belongings in your room, and they've got curtains, and you break up the sound a certain amount, you know you have to watch the overhead. I've got a, a really a tall microphone I can put way up high, uh, and then everything just kind of breaks up naturally by having all of these objects still here. You know, and then I'm sure as you're playing, the sound is bouncing off all these objects too, huh? Well, the fact that you got all the objects, it keeps them from oscillating around and coming back into the microphones. That's that's the good side of it. And there's a couch over here. You know, there's a lot of things that are breaking up the sound, but I'm still getting the wood of the room. In the air. Does the cat come in that room too? <laughs> Everybody goes away at, at, at the end of the day. Yes, she'll come in here. Not when I'm playing the drums. I hit a drum, she's under the bed. Bye. <laughs> what are some other cool things that you're working on that are coming up? Are there tours? Are there other things as things are starting to open up now and we're getting I'm back? Playing, I'm playing around town with my good friends, Teresa James, uh, her and her husband, uh, Terry Wilson, have a fun band. I'm playing with them some. I'm playing with them tomorrow night. Um, and then I've been playing around town with T-Bear, uh, a few gigs here and there. Oh, cool. And uh who else have I played with live? That's, that's about it on my live stuff. Um, I'm going to be going in early May to New York to do some shows with the, the Blues Brothers. With oh, Dan, you are? Dan Aykroyd and uh, Jim Belushi. Jim took over from John. Uh, oh, that's cool. When is that happening in May? May 4th at the, Hunting, at the uh, Paramount Theater in Huntington, New York, which is, I believe, is Long Island. Ah, that's where I hail from, Long Island. Yeah. So you're going to be there. I know where that is. Yeah. On the 4th. and um, May 4th. That, um, let's see. Doo -doo, that's a Wednesday. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, and then uh, we're, we have a couple of other so gigs. I'm going to see if we can try to get there. Yeah. 
Oh, let me know. Get in touch. And if I can guest you or, or whatever, I will. Yeah. yeah, that would be awesome. That yeah. is cool. So have you and worked with them before? The oh, well, I've been working with them since uh, uh, I was in the house band at the House of Blues. It started here in Los Angeles in the 90s, about 93. And, wow. And little by little, um, that evolved into, well, Jim, while we were there, you know, we go up to Jim and, and jokingly, I guess, said, hey, man, why don't you come and sing a song with us? And he goes, well, I don't really, so, well, you know. And he kind of was wheezing around on the harmonica and thought <laughs> and, and he was trying to think of a song he could sing. And next thing you know, he came and next week goes, dude, can I sing a song? And, and he sat in with us. And was, I hope, he, I hope, I, I'll have to play this for Jim and tell him the story. Or I'll tell him, I tell him in person. Um, you know, um, we're good friends. I spent eight years on a TV show with him. So you did. Uh, yeah, I, that was my acting career. On uh, according to Jim, I was. The, I, I That's right. I, yes, because you have done some acting there. If you go on the IMDb, uh, there are some credits there in the acting world. Yeah, I, it wasn't much of a reach for me. I was just the drummer in the Garage Band, so <laughs> <laughs> I just had to remember the lines and you know be kind of candid every once in a while. Did you enjoy that? Did the acting bug hit you at all? Or I had a ball. Yeah, it did. I, it I got did. an agent. I got an agent. I still go out and I, I, I'm doing echo cast for character type roles for uh, cool. uh, movies, TV shows and whatever is out there. And, and I've, I've read, you know, auditions for uh, commercials and stuff like that. You know, um, I, I it, it, it would take up too much of my time to dedicate myself to it. And, and, but if I did, I would be, I took some improv classes and um, I'd probably go back and do some of that and then tune up my, parts of other parts of my acting um uh, if i were to do it but what kind of roles uh do they sort of cast you for or th you know you end up going for well i was i was uh i was kind of a creepy old guy the last time i, I read for something uh for a, com what was a computer class uh i was kind of the creepy old guy and i, I do those roles well <laughs> um, and, and I like it when they have accents because I, I like to do accents. So I'll, I'll work on the accent for a day and then I'll learn the lines and then I'll. I'll so you could do a variety of different accents other than just the Southern Texas accent. <laughs> of course. Yeah. What, what else? You got something. Well, I, mean, I can do New York a little bit. You know, I mean, I can, what are you, how you doing? You know, you know <laughs> that's right. Talking to New York and New Jersey. And uh, that's, that's fantastic. <laughs> that's fantastic. I'm telling you, you should come here. You'd love the place because we got everything you need. That's yeah. it. <laughs> uh, and, and then there's, uh, and then there's, I can do an Irish. Let's see if I can do it. Oh. I can do Irish and Scottish. I just have to think about them for the a Irish second. brogue. Yeah. 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 See cool. you, Jimmy. Your show is something else. You should be on all over the world. I'm telling you. Did we, did we record that? Cause we want to use that in our next promo. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like, give me another chance. I'll give you another take. No. My uh, father has always said, who is Irish, uh, yeah. uh, whenever anybody says something kind or nice to you, ask them to please put it in writing and address it management. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. A great line. That is a great line. Great line. They have great lines. It's great oh, line. I tell you. And quick, too. Quick, I'd quick, love, quick. I'd love the sense of humor that, that I had to adapt to when I moved to England. It was different than what I'd grown up with as an American or in Texas or whatever. And then I moved to England. And it was so dry. I'm going, it's so dry at first, like right at first. I was like, it's not really that fun. But then I went, good God. Yes, it is. And then I got so into it that I didn't think that American comedy was, you know, funny anymore on TV or in movies or whatever, other than certain comedians like, uh, Richard Pryor, you oh, know. Yeah, Pryor. Yeah, you did that well. You did that whole transition well from you know the chair to the, the drums to the other room. You didn't bang into anything. You didn't. Stuff. The computer goes in the air, and I'm going. Hey! You, you didn't know. lose the Wi-Fi. A lot of people do. You didn't stub yeah. your toe. <laughs> you didn't drop the laptop. No, I could have. You it. are a pro. <laughs> I could have clowned out the the, the, the the catastrophe scene. You know. <laughs> Have somebody over and throw the computer at them, you know. So. Exactly. Why do you love all this? You, you've been doing it for years. You know, this is this is inbred. This is something that you absolutely, it's in your DNA. Uh, what, why does it bring you such uh, continued blessing and joy, Tony? 
Well, I'm a senior now, and you know, I'm um, I'm of an age where most musicians and most people would have quit their jobs four or five years ago, and gardened and golfed and taken vacations with their wife and or bought a you know RV and toured the you know I'm been around. I've been everywhere, all over the world, and traveled plenty not that i don't like to travel i do i love it and i plan on traveling more at some point but you reach a certain point in a lot of people's lives where they figure that's that's it i don't want to work anymore and i understand that and i never really got that i always thought i'll just work as long as i i'll work forever and um um i'd say in the past couple of years uh, without oh i maybe it was just the pandemic that did this slowdown i went Oh, I see why people I see why people slow down, you know, I mean, physically, of course, you have to consider that your own, you know, your physicality and your health. And uh, and you got to look after that even more the older you get. Um, but I'm still passionate about it or else I wouldn't be bouncing around and acting like a kid in my front room with you right now, you know, and I wouldn't be getting off the phone and going back to work, doing all the clerical information gathering and dealing with this artist and her vocal and that person's da 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 you know if i didn't love it somehow and and begin being creative at the same time i will say this that whether i become financially more successful or successful in any way or not would be a great thing if it just happened uh because i'm not trying to force that to happen I, i'm still trying to make money i'm still trying to be successful it, but it, that's not my end purpose. For me, um, I use the word purpose very, very uh, sincerely. To me, life now at this point is about having a purpose and having a purpose for me and hopefully for others, one that I can still entertain or that I can help or that every time I'm doing something, it means something. And I, I don't want it all to just go away go down the down the river like that though most of it does uh, i still want to see I, I approach everything like that now and that's that's really come over me in the last few years and um uh i'm, I'm done when i'm done i'm done when they don't call me anymore or no one responds to my phone calls when i call them or when physically i can't do it anymore but i'm not going to be done until Maureen in Arizona says, uh, you're living your best life. Never stop bouncing around and acting like a kid and doing your thing for sure. I agree. You know, never stop it. Uh, it's what's your, it's what you're all about, you know, and, uh, it's, it comes through you. You're sort of like a conduit of all the energy it sort of flows through you and it flows out. And the fact that, you know, with this prolific career, you know, you're also helping others and you're teaching others and sort of mentoring and, and working with so many others and paying it forward. That's a really cool thing, too, because not a lot of people always go that route. You know, they it's just them, them, them. But the fact that, you know, you're producing other people and working with other people in this way, uh, that's a really cool thing. That's that's sort of legacy building there. You got to you got to be aware of what's going on around you, whether, <clears throat> you know, if you're in a supermarket and somebody drops something, you would you go, hey, get out of my way. Instead, you go, you help them pick it up. You try How to be help. It does come back. Yes. And you always, pay, you always always pay it forward. You don't always have to get something for all of it. Right. And I think the more you do that in life with the purpose and the talent that you have, that what you do, um, that you, you can you can make a difference in people's lives. And uh, I don't know if my drumming did, but, you know, I played a lot of fun music with a lot of famous people and records that were successful. and concerts that were you know to the wall you know what i mean and um and i have been in that you know there's a lot of talk right you know in the last few years about spirituality and the source and everything i've been tapping the source playing drums all yeah. my life right and that's probably why that yes you, can, you know um you can, you can tap that source and you you live off of that more than you live off of anything else you know, mm -hmm. any other credit card. That's the biggest credit card out there. You know? Really? Absolutely. And you're doing it through your art, which I think is a really, really cool thing. Is there anything you haven't done yet that you still want to do? 
<laughs> Let's see. I almost jumped out of a sky uh, sky. I almost jumped out of an airplane. Skydiving. Yeah. but my dad wouldn't let me. Till and then when I was eighteen, I didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, I don't. I don't really know. Um, I want to be happy. I want to be able to go and sleep every night, and I want to wake up in the morning feeling hopefully energized enough to get through my day. Uh, I want to fend off all diseases and and things that happen to old people if I can, as long as I can. But you can't always, you know, and no. you do the best you can with that. And you try to take care of yourself. And my partner right now, she takes excellent care of me. And um, she, you know, gets me over the head when I'm doing things wrong. But you know, <laughs> thank you, she's so, <laughs> so sweet and nice. You know, That's fantastic. Yeah. I, I, I'm lucky. I'm just a lucky guy all around. So mm. um, I don't know what, what else to say. I want to just continue making music that entertains people and that makes a difference. And, and uh, you know, like at this thing we're doing for Ukraine, the Red Harvest. Yes. Uh, song, uh, if it can make a difference, uh, hallelujah. And, and anything else we can do like that. And, yeah. Uh, I never turn down the opportunity to do a charity. And, um, and I'm not patting myself on the back, but I just think that it's hard for me to say no. My neighbor, who I don't even know, but she's on my neighborhood watch text thread you know remember captain of the block one of the captains of the block captain of the block right she goes i've looked you up you're a very famous drummer you've got a lot of credentials and everything uh, we have a school here and we we're trying to raffle off some lessons to and i'm going oh here we go okay all right well i can't say no i'm good all right all right and uh <laughs> yes i'll i'll do it you can you know so you can raffle me off as a as for four lessons so i'll give i'll, I'll be teaching somebody that can either play or wants to play or can play or whatever for four lessons. So that's cool. That is really cool. What would the uh, Tony of today say to this Tony? Oh my God. Let's see. All right. Practice the guitar a little bit more. Keep writing songs. Um, God, I was playing a lot of soccer back then, so I can't say get in shape because I was <laughs> I was in I was in physical condition then. Um, I don't know. And keep dreaming and keep keep that purpose that you've discovered when you're the age that I am right now on TV or on this at yeah. the gym master show. Keep that purpose in mind the whole time, all your life. That's beautiful. That's those are great ways to say that. Some people, you know, what they also say sometimes they'll what if they see a photo of them back then they'll say um they'll tell them to relax that it's going to be okay yeah that's well that's because you know those early years we're all gunning and going and uh, uh we got to do we got to conquer the world we got to do it quick we got to be and now you know with the wit and wisdom and experience and still doing it and doing it beautifully you could talk to the earlier versions of ourselves and just say it's going <laughs> to be okay Jump the hurdles, swim the river, you know, climb the mountain, you know. That's it. Somebody else that did that was with us this evening. Wanted to say hello, Mr. George Burns. Oh, boy. And, uh, what, a, <laughs> oh, God. what a brilliant genius he was. How could, you know, how could you resist that talent? Because it, he just walked up and, and looked at you and you were laughing. You know? Yes. Yeah. He's, he he's all the simplest things and his delivery was so beautiful. He's got his cigar and his hanky, yeah. and he said, you knocked it out of the park tonight, kiddo. That's what he said. <laughs> <laughs> he loved it. Yeah. This is actually a collectible. My mother's the youngest of 16. Big family uh, on that side, and one of my aunts collected dolls. So when he uh, became 100, she made sure she got the uh, George Burns collectible doll and uh, got passed down to me. So we threw him on, I don't know, two years ago on the show, and everybody fell in love with him. So he's now part of the... Uh, He's part of the uh, JMS uh, Levity crew here. <laughs> the JMS Levity crew, I thank you very much for introducing me to the JMS Levity crew. God bless you all. Take care. Say your prayers for the people of Ukraine. Yes. And, and for the rest of the world that needs help as well. And do something nice for somebody. Gina says, such a great hang today. Thank you all. My pleasure. Claps coming in from Jane in Sweden. Nikki says, thank you, Tony and Jim, for bringing him on. Toby says, just keep being you. Absolutely, Toby. We love you, too. Uh, you, Jen, Jen in Pennsylvania says, do you like to draw or paint? <laughs> uh, um, God, I, I, I've probably done more drawing than painting. I, I don't really have anything to show for it, but I probably scribble more than I paint. But I have, 
I did try painting for a little while and I enjoyed it. I just never took the time to go follow that. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't, I wasn't passionate enough about it, you know? Yeah. And I, yeah. I guess I thought you had to have a real painting talent to do it. Now I realize looking back on it, maybe I should just go out and get some canvas and, you know, and start painting and get some paints. Absolutely. Uh, emojis coming in from Jane in Sweden, Mary in Florida. Wonderful meeting you, Tony. Thanks, Maureen in Arizona. Keep on, Thank you. keep it on, Tony. And God bless. And Gina. Thank you, Toby Simmons. Thank you. Love you. Yes, absolutely. A second. And the, the Ukraine colors from Gina. Absolutely. Beautiful. Uh, Jen Barry had quickly asked, uh, she usually asks some of the guests, uh, what is your Zen place? I think your Zen place is the room you were just in, but if not there or on stage or in another studio doing your thing, she always asks mountains or ocean. For me, it's the ocean growing up here in the East Coast. We're by the ocean now. I grew up with the ocean nearby. She's in the mountains of Allentown, PA. She loves the mountains. How about uh, for you? your zen i'm gonna put it two ways I, I i love being in the mountains they're beautiful and uh and when i've been in in places in the mountains that were really calm <clears throat> i really enjoyed the sort of peacefulness that i got but i i think i get more out of being next to the ocean and hearing the ocean the motion of the ocean and the sound of it once yeah. the waves are you you get so meditative and so quiet that the the, the, the ocean actually roars and you know that that's probably one of my favorite places. Me too. Yeah. Well, to joke about the whole thing of where my zen is. It's it would be playing golf in the mountains next to the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about your friend that you said that lives on the golf course? He doesn't have the ocean, but <laughs> no, golf courses are good anyway. So 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 golf is my zen getaway. In the middle of all of this, I belong to a country club nearby, and um, about fifteen minutes away, and. And sometimes I just go, I'm done. I'm done. Hi, yeah. baby. I got to go. And I grab my golf clubs and I go on and I, I go and I play for three, four five hours and I come home completely refreshed mentally and spiritually. Yes. It's my, it's my, it's my getaway for five hours. Like, you know, it's, it, that's my Zen right there. Yeah, and I'm absolutely. Come back. So every time I go, she goes, I, okay. Cause she knows I'm going to return like ready to go. That's One. it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't come back drunk and tired or anything. <laughs> yeah. um, this was absolutely awesome, my friend. Really, really awesome. We went down a lot of different roads right. and uh, past, present, future. Played some music. Lots of interactivity with our lovely viewers watching from around the world. This has been absolutely awesome. I hope we do get a chance uh, to break bread. May, I'm going to keep an eye on that. May 4th in, in New York. And uh, if I'm on a TV shoot on the West Coast, uh, I will look you up as well. And uh, lunch is on me. Lunch is on me. I appreciate that. You still have those Wendy's coupons? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll start at IHOP. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no hop. <laughs> I was going to say, if you're going to do that, take me when it's all you can eat pancake day then or something. Uh, I hope the show met whatever expectations you had, my friend, and you enjoyed the time with me and us as much as I absolutely have with you, Tony. Jim, I, 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 I thought the show would be about 20, 25, 30 minutes long. Most of the podcasts I did. I didn't realize that you were going to get as deep as you were. I was ready to condense things. And you went down the road and I went with you and, uh, and you let me go down the road. And I really appreciate that. And I hope that people weren't bored and I hope that I didn't, show myself in the wrong way or whatever. Mm, well, I don't know I am what I am. I am, you know, but I had a really wonderful time talking about this and here we are two hours later, you know, I'm still feeling really good from this. I really appreciate the, uh, the invitation to talk about all this stuff and it, it feels good to me to be able to reflect on it. And I appreciate your attention to detail. Thank you very much. The pleasure is all mine, my friend, an honor and a pleasure. And uh, as I always say, we'll keep the porch light on for you. You're welcome back anytime, Tony. And, uh, you know, we just let it roll. I tell people there's no questions. You had no idea what I was going to ask in advance. No questions, nothing prescripted, no teleprompters, uh, warm, conversational, old school like Cavett and Carson and some of the others, yeah. uh, Mike Douglas Regis, with a modern vibe and twist it today. And, uh, uh, like Kreskin said last night, <laughs> he said, we're bringing back the lost art of conversation, which wow. uh, 
which is a big, big thing that we need more of, don't we? We need to converse and listen to one another and collaborate and just instead of all this divisiveness and nonsense, you and thus and them, right? just, just exactly. have a conversation. Right. It's like a fabulous uh, tennis match, you know, and uh, it's, it's, it's absolutely perfect. It's you cool. should get the best of four or five or six people and have them all here on the, at the same time. And we can have like, you know, Hollywood wow. squares or whatever, you know, you know, I like that. That's a great idea. I, I, I think I'll do that. Yes. Would you be in for something like that? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. Good idea. I like that. I like that. Sure. Our creative department has just been hired. Tony. <laughs> Don't ask the producer. He'll tell you something. Uh, absolutely. I love it. I love it. Uh, yeah. I really, really love it. Um, good stuff. And uh, Maureen says, love any conversations. No, no time. Time goes way too fast. This has been fabulous. Thank you very much, uh, Maureen. Uh, Kathleen, she was the best. Thank you very much. Uh, Gina says, cheers, everyone. Stay safe. And uh, best of yes, please. I love that as well. And Jen says, Tony, you're now a lovety. See, I told you. I told you. You got the Grammys. But okay. how does it feel to be a gym master show lovety? That tops it, doesn't it? It made my day. Absolutely. <laughs> it made my week. Absolutely. Thank you're you. The, you're the best, my friend. Thanks for all the time. Thanks you're for welcome. all the wit and wisdom. And uh, you're a class act all the way. And a pleasure having you here. And we'll chat again soon. Okay. Peace out. Love you. Thanks, man. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye now. Uh, amazing, huh? What a great conversation. Tony Bronicle here on the show. Grammy winning drummer, producer, songwriter extraordinaire. And this was really an epic conversation as they all are, right? What we're doing here is quite different. This isn't just videos. It's not just a podcast. Uh, we're doing this like a television series, like an old school television series, but yet with the modern vibe and modern twist of today. And that's what makes it special. We really appreciate Tony coming on the show. He's a very busy guy, as you could hear. Did you hear all the beeping and the dinging and all the stuff that was going on around him? That's his phone, his computer. He was getting texts. He was getting emails. <clears throat> he was getting pings on his phone and people were calling him. I think somebody somebody had called during. <laughs> uh, that's the way it is. I mean, my phone sort of beeped and vibrated and shook quite a bit, as it always does as well. Sometimes you just got to let it do that. He's awesome. Grammy-winning legendary drummer, producer, songwriter. Check him out, of course, online and all the music. You know, all those great places, the Spotify's, the Amazons, the iTunes and, and everything um, to spend all this time. Again, what's cool about it is if you've known him for the music uh, with the various you know groups and individuals and so much more, you got a chance to learn more about the man behind it all. That's kind of like what we do here on the show. Uh, we don't call it an interview show. We call this an entertainment lifestyle variety talk show series and uh, you get a chance to learn more about me your host about our guests and about yourselves along the way which is kind of cool and uh, just some shots we showed a little bit earlier just going over some of the cool experiences the people he's worked with over the years uh everybody from bonnie Raitt, taj mahal bet midler you know you name it uh, Eric Burton uh, and so many others, really fantastic. Um, and just, and of course, Wiggly Lee Jones and on and on and on, going all the way back to the Backstreet Crawler and then some, and even this kind of cool. He's so many awards, Blues Foundation, 41st Blues Musical Awards, instrumentalist, drums nominee there. And just, he's always, you know, he's very humble about it too. You notice that when we talked about some of the awards, very, very humble. He's, uh, he's a great guy. Want to let you know also on Saturday, we have another terrific guy. Buddy Gibbons is joining us, acclaimed musician, composer, producer, the invisible rock star. He has been on and responsible for so many soundtracks, film, commercials, television series, and so much more. He's a great, great musician, drummer as well. Buddy Gibbons is with us on Saturday. You know who's with us on Monday? My good friend, Christine Ullman. Christine Ullman, Saturday Night Live Band. Yes, she's been a vocalist with SNL and the Saturday Night Live Band for years. She's still with them. You see her there on Saturday Night Live every Saturday night. She's a dear friend. I've known her for years. We've worked together. 
the Beehive Queen, acclaimed singer-songwriter from Saturday Night Live Band and so much more. Christina Ullman joins us Monday, this Monday. She's all excited. She's been sharing it. She's been spreading the word. And that's really, really special and really, really cool. We love that. Gang, you guys are the best. If you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, we would love it if you do. And if you're new to our show, subscribe and click the notification bell. There's no cost when you subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. Click the notification bell. There's a little bell icon you see there. Click that so you never miss any of the episodes, prolific episodes. We're, we've done over six, mo more than most, over 600 10, 20, 30, 40, almost 50 shows. Sometimes we've done two shows in a day. We've gone on location. We've done non-guest shows as well. Um, we've done shows that are sort of lovely host chatbacks. Uh, we've done themed shows. We've done food shows. <laughs> we've done childhood nostalgia. We do it all. That's what an entertainment lifestyle variety talk show is all about. Something for everybody, something different. Every episode. Last night we had the amazing Kreskin on. Yeah, which was really, really cool. If you didn't see that episode, he's a legend. Check that episode out. It's on our YouTube channel. You will absolutely love it. We had a, an incredible conversation exclusively here. He was something else. He is something else. Uh, don't forget to give this episode a like. Yeah, there's a little like icon you see there on our YouTube channel next to the episode. So it looks like a little thumbs up. Give it a like and leave a comment on the actual YouTube channel. That helps us big time as well, gang. So leave a comment on the actual channel. If you've commented in chat, thank you very much. But leave a comment uh, as well on our YouTube channel. That helps us. Really, really does. And if you'd like to possibly uh, give us some thanks, there's a little thanks icon on our YouTube channel as well. And uh, you can show your support for all the work that we're doing and the hours that go into it and all the production and everything that uh, we do here to make this not just a talking head show, not just throwing videos up in the air and see where they land, doing something really special with you know good high-end quality, some good vibes, some positivity, laughs galore, poignant moments, deep moments, you know, whatever direction we go in, we go in it with you and we absolutely love it. Kathleen Walker in New York says, thank you, Jim. Have a great night. Good night all. This is for the loveities that are watching live. Those of you who are watching this later on in the archives, stay right there. Another episode of the Jim Master Show Live comes right up. You are very welcome. Humbled, thankful, fun night from Jen Barry. Thank you very much. Yes, I love that. Good stuff. Buddy, yes, Buddy Gibbons coming up on Saturday. Buddy's going to catch today's show on replay, picking up family from LAX. Oh, perfect. Looking forward to him as well. And uh, let me see some others. Uh, Glenn Scarpelli is coming on the show. Yes. You know who else is coming on the show? Michael Leonard. She played the mother in the Waltons. Yes. Paul Green, your buddy Paul Green. You know Paul Green, right? Of course, from the Hallmark movies. He's a friend of mine. We worked together uh, for a couple of concert events um, at Carnegie Hall. Uh, actor, singer Paul Green is coming in April. Yes, we have the date. We're going to announce it soon. Uh, you know him, of course. He's an actor on uh, Hallmark and uh, the Hallmark Channel, but also singer extraordinaire and so much more. He's joining us as well. Nikki says, prayers going for sure. Such a pleasure to have you with us. To you as well, Nikki. Christine Clifton says, Jim, thanks for this entertaining show with Tony. Nice hearing more of his incredible career, his fun stories, love drumming or live drumming too, and love it. <laughs> Sometimes I change the words because I do it so fast. Live drumming and words of wisdom. Good night all, Jim and love it. You too as well. Really a great show. Fabulous show tonight. They all are, huh? Just think of the breadth of guests we've had on just this week alone. That's amazing. I get amazed myself. I get excited. It's a lot of work behind the scenes, but I get excited putting these shows together for all of you and you and you and you. Thank you, Jim, from Maureen in Arizona uh, for such a fun evening. I wish you all a peaceful rest of your day, night, tight, lovely hugs. Going out to everyone. Peace out. Peace out. Uh, Jim and dear loveties. You got it, my friend. Absolutely. Good stuff. Thanks for all these great comments coming in here. We. Uh, we love you all. You guys are terrific. Buddy Gibbons, wowee. 
And Sherry Larson says, thank you, Jim. What a career. Wow. Sherry Larson in Kansas. One of the greatest people on earth in sharing every episode. And we notice that and we love that about Sherry Larson. She shares the YouTube links and on all of her social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, every show, every day, sometimes even before we do it, which is fantastic. She's on the ball. She is our Midwest uh, advertising promotion captain. <laughs> we have to get, we're going to have to give you a title, Sherry Larson, because you are so, so spot on and we really appreciate it. We'd love it if all of you did it. You know, take the YouTube link and share it on your social media and invite your friends to come join us. Join our big party here at JMS Live. Jane in Sweden says, uh, this has been a fun show. Thank you, Tony, for being here with your life story and drum playing. Thanks, Jim. Thank you, Jane. And Jane is also very prolific on always posting in our Lovity Facebook group, the Gym Master Show, Lovity Hall, always uh, giving us thumbs up about the shows. She's always giving us thumbs up on our YouTube channel. And she leaves comments underneath the episodes, I think on just about every episode, which I think is fantastic. We really appreciate that, Jane and Sweden. Uh, Jim and Tony, thank you both for a great night. I learned a lot. So great to learn about Tony. Awesome. You are very, very welcome. Great show. You guys, uh, thank you, Gina, for being here on the Gym Master Show Live. I hope we get to see you again and tell all your friends about our show and Tell them to watch the series. Binge watch. We've got 600 episodes. Some of the names of the people that you heard uh, Tony say tonight, like uh, T-Bear and uh, Eddie Taduri and Lawrence Juber, they've all been on the show. You see all their episodes. But then again, we also have uh, Frida Payne, the legend. She's been on the show. Melissa Manchester has been on the show. Um, Jerry Mathers, who played Beaver and Leave It the Beaver, was on the show. <laughs> Marianne Ross, Mrs. C from Happy Days, was on the show. So many others. Uh, you guys want to see the chair, right? I don't think you can see the chair. You just see the room, but not the chair. The chair is a little bit lower. Sometimes we get a chance to see the chairs of the guests uh, when they get up. But he got up and uh, he moved right into that room and just started playing, which is really, really cool. And um, I love this. Gina is fun to hang out with. Good night, everyone. Jim and Tony from Jane. Thank you very much, Jane. And Toby says, uh, Gina, it's fun to hang out with. And she hung out with us today on the Gym Master Show Live, and we love it already. Nikki says, yes, all of you, please have a great evening and night. We sure will. And uh, those of you who aren't with us right now live, but are watching this later in the archives, because we archive every episode of our series Thank you for watching as well. I know we always talk a lot about the live viewers and we love and appreciate them, the Lovities watching live. But those of you who are Lovities or just casual viewers who watch our episodes later on in the archives, we thank you very much for watching. Spread the word about our show, our series. That means a lot to us. Uh, there's tons of episodes you can watch, binge watch literally at any time, 24-7, 365 on our YouTube channel. Absolutely. And at the end, in the credits, you know, when our theme song plays at the end, you can see if you'd like to suggest a guest or you would like to uh, be a sponsor on our show, sponsor this series, you can contact us as well. And uh, we would love to, we're looking to uh, get sponsors as well. And uh, we haven't really gone in that avenue because we've been focused on the content and doing great shows, but that would be really cool too. So uh, you can contact us uh, as well for any of that and uh, guest suggestions if there are guests you would like to see. And many of you have been really great about doing that. Uh, but if there are guests you'd like to see on the Gym Master Show Live, maybe reach out to that guest, tell them about our show and then reach out to us. You can certainly do that as well. Um, you can reach us uh, at gymmastersmedia at gmail.com, gymmastersmedia at gmail.com, or gymmasterstv at gmail.com, gymmasterstv at gmail.com, either or. Uh, if you would like to uh, suggest guests and or if you would like to sponsor or know somebody that would like to be a sponsor, uh, and we will give them some nice uh, plugging here during the live shows and elsewhere. Good stuff, gang. We love you all. Yes, absolutely, Jane. I agree. 
Always good chatting with you guys afterwards as well. We're going to scoot out of here. Anytime you see this, the Jim Masters show, you know you're in for a great time. We thank Tony for joining us once again. Extraordinary uh, artist, a legend in the industry, and a guest on the Jim Masters show live. What a fun night too, gang. We had a lot of laughs. And uh, we thank you for being with us. This is your host, Jim Masters. Thank you for your time this time. Till next time, we'll see you on the next episode of the Jim Masters Show Live. We uh, have a busy day tomorrow. I'm going to be on the air. And then I have a television interview. And um, yeah, it's dinner time, even though it's 9.30 p.m. here Eastern. <laughs> Peace from Gina. That's a cool profile photo that Gina has there. And Toby. And everybody else who's... Uh, commenting and those of you who are just casually watching uh we count you in as well all of you are of great value nothing like the gym master show with all this loving and all this fun stuff that we do here for all of you you guys are the best thanks for being with us be well love one another take care of one another of course as we always say we don't say goodbye we say see you later cheers ciao slancha shalom sayonara avita zain and all the rest Moy Loop <laughs> and all the rest. We'll see you guys soon, okay? Thanks for being with us in this episode of the Jim Master Show Live. Be well, take care, love one another, be good to one another. You, 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 and you. I love you all. Take care. Cheers. <laughs>